Okay, it's seven six thirty. Let's, uh, Brian, if you don't mind. Thank you so much. I think we have our board members present. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Laura Caps. Welcome to the Board of Education meeting tonight on October twenty seventh, twenty twenty. It is now six thirty. I am officially calling us to order. Welcome everyone who is joining us uh, in the Zoom. We've got about sixty people so far, and uh, it's nice to convene here on this fall evening. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our language access to provide instructions. Ms. Rubicalba. You will see a globe icon that says interpretation. Please click on the globe now and select English. If you are on an iPad or a phone, locate the three dot menu and select language interpretation. Then select English and click done. When it's your turn to speak, please remember to be loud and clear and speak at a moderate pace. Thank you. Are there any questions with regards to interpretation? If there are no questions, then I will ask the host to assign me as an interpreter and we may begin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bukalva, I appreciate it. So I'm going, so I'm to, going to turn it over to Superintendent Maldonado for to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you, Board President Caps. Good evening, everyone, and welcome, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Buenas noches, gracias a todos por estar con nosotros. We'll go ahead and start. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Back to you, Board Member Caps. Thank you so much. And now I'm um, tossing it back to you for the oh. superintendent's report. <laughs> yes, I just, that's right. Mr. Rouse, if you can just um, bring up a couple of slides um, for us, please. Uh, board members, I wanna uh, just share with you in our public that last week we had the opportunity to visit Goleta Valley Junior High School. I wanna thank Assistant Principal Clancy Choi and Dean Ryan Sportel, along with many of the teachers who walked the campus with me and board member, Dr. Reed, SBTA President, Karen McBride, and the director and our director of facilities, Steve Vizzolini. The walk gave us an opportunity to learn more about the way staff are organizing themselves and learning more about ways the spaces will be used given our social distancing requirements. We also discuss how we might work together to ensure students have an opportunity to move during their break times. So we know developmentally junior high school kids uh, have a lot of needs to move around. This work is part of our greater outreach to staff and teachers who will be implementing our hybrid reopening in January. With that, I do wanna uh, uh, share with you two areas of focus uh, for this superintendent update. One is our small cohort progress. And then I also have two students with us today who'll tell us a little bit more about the work with the superintendent's advisory task force. But let's start with Dr. Wagenick to give us a quick update on this progress of small cohorts. Dr. Wagenick, are you with us? Yeah. I'm unmuting. <laughs> All right, thank you, Ms. Maldonado. Uh, good evening. Uh, President Caps and board members. Our first round of small cohorts focused exclusively on addressing the acute needs of our students. And to date, nearly 700 students are being served in 67 small cohorts across the district. In conjunction with your decision to reopen schools um, on January 19th, you also authorized staff to expand in-person opportunities now uh, for learning and social emotional support and enrichment, um, especially on our secondary campuses. Uh, we currently have four schools, one of them um, an elementary school and then three secondary schools who are ready to, to launch new cohorts uh, very soon. And those include the following activities, vocal music, academic learning centers, yearbook, leadership, play production, and construction technology. In addition, both elementary and secondary schools are going to continue to expand small cohorts uh, for students who exhibit acute uh, academic need to the extent that staff and space allow. Elementary schools will also be allowed to bring small groups of students on campus for the purpose of social emotional support and counseling. 
The state's original guidance on small cohorts was uh, provided to conform to purple tier guidelines, which are very strict. But per uh, Susan Klein Rothschild of Santa Barbara Public Health, um, now that we have been in the red tier for four weeks and are approaching the orange tier, the constraints of the purple tier guidelines are no longer required. Um, we, we don't have to limit ourselves in terms of the number of students and adults in a given cohort. Now we operate those co cohorts under the, the guidance of, of social distancing of six feet or greater, mandatory face coverings, frequent hand washing, um, screening and regular cleaning and disinfecting. And I look forward to bringing you the next update because I, I know that we'll have um, many more small cohorts that would have will have begun operation um, on November 10th. Um, back to you, Ms. Maldonado. Thank you, Dr. Wagenick. Next up, um, if we can go to our next slide. I've been conducting meetings with uh, reentry advisory task force members, teachers, principals, and others, but I also have convened a superintendent student advisory group. And last week, Ms. Sean Carey and I met with about eight students from the different high schools. We invited them to give some remarks to you tonight. I'd like to welcome Yaritza Gonzalez and Maya Samarasen from Dos Pueblos High School. Uh, principal Bill Wood Woodard is from uh, is the principal. And so with that, I'm gonna invite Maya to speak first and then Yaritza. Good evening, Superintendent Maldonado, President Caps, and members of the board. Thank you for allowing us to bring the student voice to the board meeting. My name is Maya Samarasena and I'm a senior at Dos Pueblos High School. We will be speaking to summarize our personal opinions as well as the thoughts and opinions expressed through meetings with the superintendent student advisory board and recent conversations with peers. I think it's important we work towards opening schools in a safe way where students, parents, and teachers feel comfortable with it. We have to bring into consideration the fact that going to schools pre-COVID shutdown still had a chance to make you sick. It is important for the school board and teachers to come up with ways to actually enforce mask wearing, social distancing, and proper sanitization on campus. As a student body, there is not an overall consensus of what we want to do, as shown by the student survey results that were split almost down the middle for high school students. It varies from person to person, and we, as a community, have to understand that. If putting kids back in school has a higher risk than reward, it's not worth it. So we must make sure we have systems, rules, and precedents in place to keep schools and children safe. Students are worried about doing things correctly, especially, especially with vulnerable family members at home. We would appreciate acknowledgement from our schools that everyone feels differently and that that's okay in an effort to erase the stigma of the other side. One other point we'd like to bring up is that our understanding is that we are supposed to decide on whether or not we want to return to hybrid learning or stay in distance learning the week of November 2nd to 6th. If this is true, this timing is very close to the election and a lot happening at once. It will be tough to make a decision in the middle of such big national events. And now I'm gonna hand it over to a fellow committee member, Yuritsa. Hi everyone, my name is Yuritsa and I'm a junior at Dos Pueblos High School. There are many students who are excited and looking forward to return to school in person, but we need to be reassured that the safety protocols will be enforced. School sites have not had clear, school sites have not had clear answers around enforcement of safety protocols, which is making students hesitant about returning. We know most people ideally want to go back and the measures are in place, but we need to feel reassured that everyone will follow the protocols. With safety measures properly enforced and normalized, that would eliminate a lot of student concern. I would like to acknowledge a few other concerns we've heard. One is the obvious spikes for COVID that are going to increase as we come closer to the week to two week long holidays. Focusing on our December break, moving quickly into January, then we're back to school. Families and friends would have gathered and traveled, which will result which will result in a spike, just as we saw for the 4th of July. Another concern I've heard is that students feel like they'd miss out if they choose not to go to hybrid. Some worry that teachers will prioritize students at school rather than those online, and they would miss out on hands-on work like science labs and art projects. One other point when looking forward to planning student activities, 
even if we do go back to school based on a date, which makes sense for the semester, activities should be restarted based on what tier we're in as a county instead of being based on a date. Lastly, a factor to consider for most students is that online learning has made it harder to retain information and harder to collaborate with other students and teachers. Thank you for hearing, thank you for hearing from the students. We appreciate the opportunity to give our input. Thank you so much, Maya and Yaritza. I really appreciate you guys uh, listening to your peers, talking to others as you put your remarks together and always uh, the wisdom from our children in these times. So board members, that is our superintendent report for today. I'll turn it back to you. Maya and Maritza, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you to Superintendent Maldonado for convening this group and for you both to be here. You've started us off in the exact right way to have a productive conversation tonight. So thank you, both to you. And thank you for the work. I know this is extra work on top of a busy time. October is a tough time to be in high school, a lot of pressure. So thank you, thank you. I'm gonna now ask the uh, board uh, to item five, board comments and correspondence. Who would like to start? Dr. Reed. Thank you, President Caps. And also I wanna thank Maya and Yaritza and um, just also say the importance of student advocacy, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, I truly have and continue, I wanna say to appreciate the ongoing feedback from students, parents, teachers, and staff. And I, I also wanted to state again, how I very much feel it is very important to read every email that comes across our district site. And I take the emails, they help me formulate questions and comments, as well as taking public comment. And then I also devise my own based on the information from the district and others that I meet with. So though we receive hundreds of emails, um, I want you to know that I try and I can't always respond to every one of them. However, the emails that go to the entire board currently are being responded to by President Caps, and provides the appropriate staff to follow up questions. So I wanna just move on to say again, the importance of student advocacy and that I definitely support it. I will be requesting at the end of this meeting per our agenda protocol, that we have a specific laid out plan for a student board member to be put on the board. Something that I've advocated prior to our new superintendent coming on board, something we spoke about when she did come on board and something that I wanna set in motion immediately. I would like a transparent plan as how this can be implemented in 2021. I also wanna acknowledge the heartfelt conversations that I've had with students since our last board meeting. It is difficult and painful to listen to students who are experiencing mental health challenges and struggles. I attended the student march where students requested a peaceful but in a deliberate manner the return back to school. I, along with Superintendent Maldonado, Assistant Superintendent Dr. Fran Wagonet, Assistant Superintendent Sean Carey and board member Caps and two parents from the march met with two students to hear their concerns from this group. It was emotional. It was hard to hear, it was inspiring, and it was thought provoking. And it was important to see student advocacy in action. I can't imagine how it must feel to be in the midst of this as a student. I so admired the students that came forward to stand for their rights, share their struggles with mental health, academic challenges, their needs to experience social connection, games and sports, clubs, struggles to just survive and navigate the internet, and sometimes, yes, testing. There are high stakes involved. Students are claiming that there is cheating going on, that this isn't fair, that those saying perhaps are being taken advantage of the situation. And I wanna follow up that later in our board report on the school reopening. Students are also saying, I am concerned with the safety aspect as was mentioned by our two student representatives. And there are many students that are really not interested in coming back to school as well, wanting to, realizing they miss it, but they really want it to be safe and they're not ready necessarily to return in the hybrid model. So I just want to acknowledge the student piece because I think it's vital. 
I also want to just say too that teachers are wondering what is expected of me in this process only is this a process only district directed or is it site based directed I think we came to that um, uh, understanding at the last board meeting that that it, district sets the 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 policy but it's within the each school site how the culture is framed how this how this how the process is going to be um, supported and implemented. And I think it's important and I want to appreciate the work that Superintendent Maldonado has done to impress upon the principals and for them to take on that new leadership role in this perspective around COVID. Um, I think we also, I had the opportunity as Superintendent Maldonado stated to go to a school site and walk through to look at how the hybrid model was actually gonna be implemented. And as uh, Superintendent Maldonado stated, there was a lot of discussion. I think what I was impressed with was the fact that many of the teachers and admin staff created new questions um, that rose from our conversation. I wanted to thank the Dean of Students, Ryan Sportell and Assistant Principal Clancy Chiu because they were very, they were they had a plan in place and they had um, a system and process in place but what this conversation led to was we need more discussions we need more opportunities to hear from the people who are on that particular campus to talk about what their concerns were and what their challenges are and so um i really wanted to impress on the superintendent and we both agreed unanimously that there would be an opportunity that all the board members would be able to attend different sites um, at each site to board members and be able to really observe and understand and be a part of the conversation at each site that would be led by um, what, whom the principal chose to have in that meeting, but that the information that was come, came from that meeting would be disseminated amongst that particular staff in school. But I'd also like to ask Superintendent Maldonado that it also be framed to other school sites, what school sites have come uncovered as best practices for that particular school campus. Because those best practices, why are we reinvent the wheel if some of those could be working in other campuses? So I just think the information should be spread across the whole um, district principal's team. And finally, I just had a chance to attend the professional development session with Dr. Fisher. And it was amazing to see over 800 teachers responding instantaneously with ideas, excitement, challenging questions, and realizing, not surprisingly, that our teachers are doing a lot of these things. The, our teachers are, we're actually creating even more ideas in split seconds. And it was, it's just the creativity, the expertise and, um, and the willingness to, to keep that lifelong learning positionality was very, very impressive and inspiring. And I just want to acknowledge all of the teachers on that, um, on that professional development and learning that teaching doesn't have to take place only in a synchronous moment. It can be asynchronous. It could be a flipped classroom. It can be breakout groups. There are so many different ways of, of teaching and learning and it's evolving every single day, right now, every moment. And so our, I hope that our teachers and will push for our teachers to be able to continue to be provided with professional development in up-to-date ways to teach and manage a hybrid model and remote learning. So I thank them for all the work that they're doing and for the providing an opportunity that the district has given in this most recent professional development session. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Dr. Reed. Anyone else wanna share their comments? Uh, of, this is about correspondence that we've heard uh, since we last met. Uh, Ms. Sims Moten. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, glad everyone's on the, um, the site. We're having more numbers coming up, so we feel we're gonna have some great participation. And so I just wanna start out with a thank you. I mean, for all this process and, and we're, we're working every day, figuring out 
how are how we best fit in this situation as things are changing every day, but we know we're toward the goal of really opening up safe and healthy in that manner. And I heard that very loud and clear when Maya, Maya and Aritza spoke. So thank you so much for your voice and lending your voice to this process. It is really, it is critical in terms of how you feel as a student, as you are most closely impacted to the things that we're doing. So I appreciate your voice and the things that you're bringing up. So continue to, to do that. And um, I also support the, um, a student board member coming on so that I'm looking forward to that process as well. Um, and I, I, again, we all, every last one of us have a role to play in successful turn, you know, return to school in person. And what, there's no small role. Everyone has one in terms of that. And so the more that we continue to communicate um, with each other, uh, be transparent about the information that we're sending out and being open and honest and being candid about something. If, it, if you don't agree with it in a respectful way, say, I'm concerned about this. And so I see that and I appreciate that and everyone really working hard to have the best success for, for all of us. And I also wanted to just announce that um, the doc, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, the 2021 essay and poetry contest is out. And I will send this flyer to uh, Cami to make sure that the principals get that information if you don't have it already. Um, the, the deadline to get that information in is November 16th, 2020. And I'd like to just real briefly say what the theme is because I think it is so uh, appropriate to what we're talking about, what we're gonna continue to talk about is, is the, the things that we're facing. And I look forward, I really want to make sure students get this because I really look forward to what they're going to say in their essay or their poetry uh, and with regards to it. And the theme is the ultimate measure of a person is not where they stand in moments of comfort and convenience, but where they stand at times of challenge and controversy. And we're right in the middle of that. So I am really, really looking forward to hearing what our students have to say. So I want to make sure that everybody gets this, gets the opportunity to get their their information in um, essays ages 6 to 12 or ages 13 to 18, as well as the poetry is 6 to 12 and ages 13 to 18. And there's over a thousand dollars that be re rewarded. But I am really looking forward to um, hearing what our students have to do because that's an opportunity to write about it and express that way. And, and hopefully, perhaps we can start a tradition of when we get back to person hanging those, uh, in, hanging those essays and portraits. In our, in our board member, making it really in our boardroom, making it really about the student voice. It's what it's about in, in terms of those pieces. So I'd like to see us do that as well. So uh, thank you again, everybody, for the work that we're doing together. Continue to work, uh, making sure we get back in person in a safe way. So thank you. Ms. Ford. Uh, thank you so much, President Caps. Well, um, first, I just don't remember an October ever being this busy or this contentious. Um, it was always a fun month at school with fall festivals, fairs, costume parades, exciting instruction and the like. But again, this is such a reminder that 2020 is like no year ever. I do have a few thoughts. Um, one is that I thought I'd mention a couple of interesting turns of events, current events, other than COVID-19, which rely on science. It's really exciting to discover that there is water on the moon and what it might mean for future space exploration and astronomy. It's also exciting to know that Lucy Calkins, the guru of whole language reading instruction, has reviewed the data and the science and finally agreed that young students need structured, systematic approach to learning phonics. So I just say, go science. <laughs> um, also, I visited Montecito Union School at the invitation of Virginia Alvarez and observed in person, school in person, in session. It was gratifying for me to observe the many details that we will need once we open in person too like they had six foot long banners everywhere around the campus just to show people and remind especially little kids about social distancing and really what six feet looks like. And also talking with the teachers gave me insight and inspired me as we consider our next steps. And finally, I am really delighted to call out two retirements in our district that happened in the past few weeks. One is Marianne Miss, Miss, I'm sorry, Miss Mitchie. Um, she's a teacher from Dos Pueblos and she dedicated 16 plus years of service to our district. And Michael Torres, who is from uh, Goleta Valley Junior High School, he dedicated 34 years of service to our district. 
congratulations to both of you with my gratitude for your service and hopes that you stay safe and healthy, especially during the time of COVID-19 so that you can enjoy your retirement. Finally, Doug Fisher reminded us that mistakes are normal and are great role modeling for students. So uh, it was just a wonderful reminder that we are all learning all the time. Um, don't forget to vote, stay safe on Halloween and go Dodgers. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Ms. Munoz. Okay, um, I appreciated the uh, superintendent's report with the collaboration and participation of the students. Um, the student voices are so important. Um, thank you, Maya and Yuritsa. Um, thank you so much. You made good points. You know, there's nothing like the viewpoints of our uh, students. Um, I also, like Dr. Reed and, um, and Ms. Sims Moton, um, support the uh, position of a student on our school board. Um, that's the students are why we're here and to have students participate in that. Um, thank you, Ms. Maldonado for arranging for that. I appreciate it. Um, the best report <laughs> is hearing from the students about, you know, their concerns, the safety, um, wanting to have priority for students, whether they be in class, in um, or whether they are online, and also just the um, social isolation that I talked about earlier, um, wanting to be, you know, with other students, have sharing their experiences, and and such for their own support. Um, I have attended the uh, Martin Luther King, you know, um, celebration in the past and been able to hear firsthand from the students their essays and their poetry. Um, so I very much encourage students, you know, thank you, Ms. Sims Moton for um, providing that information about um, how, stu how, you know, students stand in, in the midst of challenge and controversy. If any time this year has been um, certainly one that's been, you know, something that most of us have never faced um, in the past. So very much, you know, the November 16 deadline, um, I look forward to to that and um, and also, you know, in terms of the year, um, you can feel the change in the weather now um, with the cold coming on, um, the coldness in the mornings and in the evening, um, Halloween, and also um, the Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead that we celebrate, you know, the souls that have passed um, on November 1st. Um, and, you know, recognizing that as, as a cultural um, holiday. And I enjoyed the, um, the altar that's just outside here in the district office that Martha put together. Um, and um, along with our, you know, um, with RBG there, <laughs> um, recognized. So um, thank you so much. Thanks, Ms. Munoz. And, um... I um, I just wanted to talk about a couple a couple items. I uh, was grateful to be at Franklin again last week uh, with Miss Ford. I'd been there previously. They have such a great uh, system, and, and so many of our systems are so automated now that we never did before. So on Fridays at Franklin, it's like an assembly line with cars driving up, getting all the materials for their students. Uh, students can interact in a safe way with their teachers if need be. And then at the end of the assembly line, you get your wonderful, uh, nutritious, free meal. So it's just a, a wonder to behold um, and, and such dy dynamic energy. And those teachers are are there and, and they talked about how important it is to see their kids. And, and that's what we know. We know that everybody wants to be back in the classroom. I also did attend the uh, protest of students and was grateful to be part of a meeting as Dr. Reed mentioned, with the superintendent and other uh, members of the cabinet. And just again, to hear directly from students is uh, so important, especially high school. I, you know, my heart breaks for high school students right now. These are such important memories and important times. Um, and what you're doing to adapt is remarkable. It's admirable. And to hear um, you know, to hear that directly actually in person for the first time in a while, because we've certainly been communicating, but mostly digital. So thank you. To, and I just want to pick up on something that Maya said um, 
at the start of this meeting was that, you know, there, there is no consensus as to the right path forward. And people have very specific uh, reactions to this virus, depending on our, our own health, depending on our uh, different levels of, of experiences. And, and she said, use the word no judgment. And I just think that's so important. That's what I try to do uh, when we receive, you know, hundreds and hundreds of emails. And I'm grateful for those emails. Most of them are respectful, um, but everybody has a different perspective and there's not one right perspective or wrong perspectives. It's, it's an individual reaction to this crisis that we're all going through. Um, and so in that spirit, I did wanna explain a little bit about correspondence under this agenda item, because I do think it's confusing to most who, you know, many people haven't engaged with the school board ever and now they are, which is a good thing. Um, but some might be frustrated that we can't answer a lot of the very, very detailed questions that are put forward in your emails. Um, we are a governing board, uh, not an operating board, which means we're not necessarily, we can say things just as an example, like I'm an advocate for outdoor learning, let's get tents, but I'm not the one deciding where the tents go, <laughs> right? That's, that's for a staff and a team of experts, of educators, of facility directors, people, the experts that, that we, you know, um, have the, the privilege of putting in that position in that authority by hiring a superintendent who oversees their work. So I just wanted to explain that because um, we do our best to respond to the emails, but it might be frustrating, particularly for those of you who are just engaging with the school board for the first time, that a lot of these detailed questions aren't ones um, for us to necessarily answer. I'm so glad that there's an FAQ of frequently asked questions document that's now on the website. That's something that I've been uh, encouraging for a while. It's, it's well done and it's a great tool. But just to also explain there, that is, those aren't board policies. Those are staff driven decisions that of course, this is a time for the board to engage. And that's another piece just to provide a little bit of education here about um, about the way the board functions. I've had some reactions, rightly so. Wow, it's these are messy board meetings. How come all this stuff isn't decided yet? Well, this is the only time in which the board can meet. Um, and so these are actually not necessarily public meetings. They are public meetings, but it's the, the work of the board in public rather than a presentation where everything's been all de determined and decided and buttoned up so that we can present to you. Um, just wanted to explain that because it certainly took me um, a while to get my head around that as a, a, a new board member four years ago, but I understand it now and internalize it that uh, due to the Brown Act, which um, is a California uh, statute that governs how all local um, bodies behave, uh, we can't, it, it, it's all in the sake of transparency so that the public has a view on our work. This board doesn't meet independently ever uh, unless it's in public like tonight. So certainly we can have interactions with Steve Vizzolini about the tents, but as, a, as five of us, we can't talk to him about where those tents are going to go. This is the opportunity for that. I just wanted to give some explanation there as we move forward in that spirit of no judgment, because again, there's such variety of, of perspectives, but information is the common denominator. If you're informed and if there's transparency and there's communication, then we're doing our job. And that's really uh, what motivates me behind this meeting today, because we are facing some, a critical decision for families and for teachers to decide how they will engage when we move into a hybrid model in January. And so we will move into this next part of the meeting with that spirit in mind that information is, is the utmost value right now. Just wanted to share that. Thank you. So that's it for me. We can move on to item D, which is always a good one, uh, acceptance of donations. I move to accept donations with gratitude. Thank you, Ms. sims -Moten. I see a second by Ms. Ford. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion Ms. carries. Oh, it's 7.06, so we will move. Maybe that's what you're going to say, Dr. Reed. I was gonna um, say but also the fact that we, yeah, we had the public comments that we didn't get to. Well, no, we are going to, uh, we're going to move into our time certain report, um, right. which is, um, and we have comments for those. And then we will, after we do our, um, 
report on the reopening of schools, we will move back to the agenda item um, in order. So let me move to item G1. We're six minutes off, but not too bad, which is the board report number nine on school reopening. And I'm gonna turn it over to Superintendent Maldonado. So just to repeat, we will have the board, we'll have the report um, from the executive cabinet. And then we will turn to, I think there's about eight or nine speakers and then the board will have a chance to deliberate and ask questions. Superintendent Maldonado. Thank you once again, Board President Caps. And um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I do wanna start off with, uh, you know, thank you for that framing. And I wanna continue to commend board members and trustees as you continue to work with me and staff. As you have all said, on making these difficult decisions and ensuring the safety of all in SB Unified. Your, your guidance, your questions are really invaluable to us. And I wanna thank all our community um, as they support us as we continue to pivot in these uncertain times um, and also the support of many of our families. As you have stated, I've also uh, made it a, uh, a courageous attempt to read all email and uh, we will continue to answer your questions as quickly as possible. And, and it led to the, uh, our document on our webpage, which we'll talk more at length later. Um, I also want to you know, acknowledge that you all have given us great input, advice, your thoughts, some stories of your families, which make these decisions so heart-wrenching. And I just want to say that um, thank you for sharing all that openly. I also want to say that I have a lot of respect for our staff and educators who are continually being asked to pivot our practices and our approaches. Uh, the parents who are having to make these decisions in ways that we never thought we would have to make decisions as parents before. And then of course our students who have their opinions and depending on their developmental stage, the ability to express these opinions in a way uh, that their learning can be challenging for some and it can, and for others uh, maybe thriving. The complexities of this work are not unnoticed, and yet we're also teaching and learning experts who plan to deliver on our promise of a quality education. So I want to continue to reassure the community that um, our, our work is uh, all systems go to try to open our school, not to try, our, our work is all systems go to open on January 19th. But we want to open our schools with safety as our number one priority. So let's go to our next slide. As part of this journey, I want to remind the board members of many shifts that we have made. Uh, as you can see here, March to June, we switched to emergency distance learning. Uh, July to August, we quickly pivoted back to improving our distance learning. And I feel that I, we, we deserve a big shout out to our teachers for doing that well and engaging in teacher capacity development in those summer months, opening on August 18th. Uh, in September, we were given the option to uh, open, to apply for an elementary waiver. And of course, as you know, at that time, the guidance was that we needed to include the voices of all stakeholders. We didn't have overwhelming support to do so, but we did begin at the end of September. And now, as you have heard, uh, bring back small cohorts of students and athletics. Our county has reached the metric to return to school and we continue to phase in those small cohorts. All this journey has exacerbated inequities for all our students in the very vulnerable categories that you see here. I'm very proud of Santa Barbara Unified's device and internet connectivity, which has really put us in a place as a district that many others can't say they're at, which is that 100% of our students have devices and are connected. And these we know are essential and have uh, inequitable practices in other places that we don't have to contend with. I also want to thank our food uh, services workers um, and uh, who continue to deliver on nutritious meals. And we are going to see more food being delivered through our food bank in partnership with UCSB in the coming days. Next slide. Board members, I wanted to make sure that you understand and I want to underscore the phases of implementation, the work that we are doing in this area. As you can see from this slide, we have done a lot of work in our phase one between the months of July and September around just redesigning schools, distance learning and hybrid learning, implementing safety and health protocols, designing new learning spaces, uh, ensuring that the childcare programs are in place for our employees and our community and our families, 
continuing to determine feasibility of our planning and gathering input through polls and surveys. In phase two, you can see that we're continuing some of this work, but we're also started to update our health and safety protocols as we continue to see guidance changing in, in, from public health, continuing to reassess our staffing needs, initiating additional hiring, which we'll hear more about in a minute. And then of course, working with their families to make sure that they have all the information that they need around health and safety protocols and instructional models and gathering, continuing to gather input. In phase three, you'll notice that we will continue to hold student orientations uh, and family orientations on hybrid learnings when we we'll return on in January 19th. Um, we'll continue to uh, offer a quality distance learning program and a hybrid learning program for all so that nobody feels left out and uh, ensuring that we're continuing to offer extracurricular activities. So there are phases to this work. I won't read the rest of it, but keep in mind that we're also gonna start to plan our 21-22 school year in the spring. And some of the regular business of the board of the district will have to continue on top of uh, dealing with this pandemic. I'll, I'll show this next slide really quick. Uh, I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, you've seen this, we look at the virus, we look at our drivers, we look at our preparedness. We'll go to the next slide. Um, this is another new slide that we prepared for you. We wanted to make sure that we call out that new to the way we do business in our school district is the guidance that's driving a lot of the decisions that we make. We're looking at guidance from the CDC. We're looking at our California public health regulations, which have changed between uh, July and October. We're looking at our county public health regulations. That also informs our policies and practices that we then report back to this board about. Things like, again, health and safety, instructional designs, facilities, uh, family program selections. So I wanted to just ground us on some of the journey, but also some of the ways that we make these decisions. And you know, for the first time in a global pandemic, we're having to work hand in hand with other organizations to do this work. So with that, I'd like to, Welcome my partner in crime, if you can call it that, Ms. Susan Klein Rothschild, who's gonna to talk to us a little bit about what's happening in public health. So thank you for being with us again, Susan. Thank you, I was muted. I'm glad to return to you. So we are again in Santa Barbara County in the red tier. Uh, the, we just had a review with the Santa, uh, California Department of Public Health and we are in the red tier. I want you to know that in terms of our health equity score and in terms of our number of positivity cases out of those people who test the percentage who are positive, those are both in the orange. The one that's still in the red is the case rate and that's gone up a little bit. So we all need to work together. That's the only way it'll work. And, and none of us have a crystal ball, but we all know we have control, that if we wear masks, if we have physical distance, if we do hand washing and we avoid crowds and stay with our own, our own groups, our own households, we can change this and go to the orange. And that's safer for everybody, every staff person and every child who's in school. So we really wanna help that happen. One of the ways we're working to make that happen is we started a new campaign, Masked and Mighty, uh, and you have some board members here who are a part of that. It is a positive, colorful campaign to remind people, these are the things we can do to take control of our community and make it safer for our schools to open, for our businesses to be open to do those things. And let me briefly just tell you that buildings will be lit up in, in light of uh, Masked and Mighty. So some of the things, parents and families can do on Halloween is put their kids in the car and drive and see these colorful buildings. We have coloring pages where we have videos and anyone can submit a 30 second video about why do they wear their mask? Why are they mighty? What, what it means to them? We also have a teacher discussion guide that can be modified for teachers with students at every age. Why are we doing this? Why is it important? What's going on? So those are some of the things that we're working on. We want Santa Barbara County to be going down, to be in the orange, to be in the yellow. We want it safer for everyone. And that means it'll take all of us to help us get there. And we have a couple more slides, Susan, that we can just, uh, I know that we shared a bit about this at the last meeting. There's two more slides. This is, this is really helpful. 
out of all the people who've had COVID in Santa Barbara County, what age were they that they tested positive for COVID? And you'll notice that we do have children that have tested positive for COVID. Some people have the mistaken understanding that children do not get COVID. That's not true. We have a 318 cases of children zero to nine and 834 cases of kids 10 to uh, 2019. These are by 10 year increments. And this was as of the end of September. You notice that the highest age group with COVID is the 20 to 29 year olds. We need them, those who think they're invincible, <laughs> to know they can get COVID, they can transmit it and put us all at risk. And even though those at the highest age groups, those 70 and older, we have a small number, those are the ones who have most likelihood of hospitalization and death. We are all in this together. So that's the ages of the people who have COVID in our community. I think the next slide is important also. On the left-hand side, you see, what is our population by race and ethnicity? So all of Santa Barbara County, approximately 48% are Hispanic Latino and about 43% are, are white. So if that's our county, we would expect that people getting COVID would be similar to that, but it's not. Look at the next circle. It shows you that a much higher percentage, 65% of those with COVID are Hispanic Latino, much more represented in the COVID cases than in the general population. Now, is that because of where they work and their jobs? Many of them are risk jobs. Are they essential workers? Is that because some of them are living in more crowded conditions? I don't know all the reasons, but I know it's not representative of the, of the community. And then if you go to hospitalizations, they're even more overrepresented. 74% of our hospitalizations are people of Hispanic Latino background. That's really important. We want everyone in our county and our community to be safe. That means we all need to take these steps. And this is part of that picture of health equity. How do we look at that? And the final circle is about deaths and race and ethnicity by deaths. So that one is actually more closely aligned with our population than any others. These are important things for us to look at. We want to get the COVID rates down. We want no groups of people to be overrepresented. We don't want some people getting sicker and getting the cases more frequently than others. We want everyone to be safe. I don't know if there are any questions about that for me. Well, I think we're gonna wait our, for questions at the end. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Um, and thank you for sharing this information. Can we go to the next slide? Um, I really appreciate Susan's call to action for all of us. I really believe strongly in Santa Barbara Unified. We're so close to Orange. We can do this. And not only that, I do want everyone to know that we are in all systems go towards reopening in January. I want to be sure that you see our work plan in the next couple of weeks, knowing that we have several uh, holidays coming up as our young students shared with us today. However, our commitment is to have two strong two-way communication. That is very important. And as we have continued to engage with our task force members, principals, parents, teachers, and community members, we've created additional communication um, that you'll see from Ms. Barnwell in a minute. But I want you to take a look at this re-entry timeline. We know that parents are gonna be asked to select a program next week, November 2nd to the 6th, but there's still gonna be an opportunity the following week for them to verify, is this your selection? Is this what you want to choose? So there's almost a two week window for us to really engage back and forth with our parents so that they feel comfortable with their selections. We then will take all of the choices that our parents have made and work on building brand new master schedules and reorganization plans from K to 12th grade. We know that we're going to take a break around the Thanksgiving holiday. And then when we come back the week of December 14th to the 18th, we'll be providing our schools and parents their schedules for the following um, return to school in January. The week of January 4th to the 15th, I'm proposing that we have orientations in our school sites where parents and students can come and see all the things that have been put in place for ways we're gonna manage our way, our, our walk, walking through hallways, uh, the spaces that will be used, how food will be served, how we will check in students, our different um, tools that we'll be using to check for temperature and our ways that we will isolate students if there is an outbreak or if somebody gets ill. All the things that will make sure that people can understand we are ready and we are all systems go to open in January. 
So with that, I want to turn over to Ms. Barnwell to just talk a little bit about more, more about our communication plan and how that two-way communication is resulting in us preparing better answers for the community and our parents. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I hope that most of you um, have received via Parent Square the the, um, the, ref the reflection of hundreds and hundreds of questions we've been getting that have come together in topical kind of thematic uh, categories. And now we have been able to compile into a new web page that is about 30 questions right now of the most frequently asked questions we've been receiving and the most thoughtful responses we have at our fingertips to be able to get you the information you need to help you inform your decisions for next week. I'm kind of speaking to parents right now, but um, I know that this is something that we, I would have loved to have had this done sooner. It, it's taken this much time for us to get our heads around how to respond um, in, in some of these cases, some of these questions a month ago weren't even on our radar. And now today we have questions that people need answers to as soon as possible. So if you haven't had a chance to review the questions, it's available in both Spanish and in English on our website. Um, there's a link, uh, there's an icon right on the homepage where you click on frequently asked questions and you can go straight to the page. Um, one quick reminder is that you know if you if you have questions that are not conveyed there and you feel like this is something that's not just a one-off but it's a, something that everybody would want to know please reach out to me uh, c barnwell at sbunified.org and i will take that question get it answered and incorporate it into this document if i can um, it's this document that the, is going to change with time as our conditions change there i was looking back at some of the questions we responded to uh, two months ago, and those are not like non-issues non now. So as we move forward through this, I know parents and, and board members and all of us staff have a lot of questions, so please keep them coming. And this will be a, a great format for us to share the most timely responses, but keep checking it as, as uh, conditions change. And with that, I'll hand it off to uh, Ms. Carey. Thank you. Thank you, Cami. Good evening, President Caps and board members, Superintendent Maldonado and cabinet. Um, I just wanted to, as we talk, um, Ms. Escobedo, my counterpart and I, about the hybrid model for secondary schools and for elementary schools, I wanted to introduce it by just resurfacing that question of why hybrid? And um, what we really know very clearly from an analysis of staffing and facilities um, it's, it's that we will need a hybrid model of instruction in order to achieve the appropriate distancing that we need to have um, to maintain health and safety. Also, the hybrid model lets us preserve flexibility. Um, we've talked a lot this evening about the constantly changing conditions, and we've built models that will allow us to move um, up or down that continuum of in-person or distance learning as needed. Um, but our hybrid model, to be clear, for PK-12 across our entire system will be characterized by three main things. And these are continuations of what we've seen in our traditional program pre-COVID and even in our distance learning program, um, especially this school year. First, strong positive connections between students and their teachers and peers. This is always important, but it's become especially important and we're also aware of it. Ongoing access to standards aligned, differentiated, and culturally and linguistically sustaining curriculum for all students. And finally, rigorous teaching and learning that develops critical thinking and other higher order thinking skills and 21st century skills. At this point, I'll hand it off to Ms. Escobedo for more of an overview. Thank you so much, Sean. Good evening, board members. Good evening, Santa Barbara. Uh, I know this is one of our most frequently asked questions, and so I'm very, I'm very happy to be able to share some specific details uh, that really kind of uh, span the TK-12 learning experience in the hybrid model that we've developed for Santa Barbara. So uh, these are some details, again, that are uh, applicable to TK through 12. Uh, so our hybrid our hybrid model will be uh, involve an in-person uh, model that consists of group A and group B with 50% of the students at school and 50% of the students at home alternating their days. It also includes uh, daily interactions with 
for both groups with the teacher and their peers. Uh, both groups A and B will participate in distance learning online with teacher for half a day on Wednesdays. And there will be two days of in-person uh, learning with the teacher and the peers, um, at, as well as two days of them learning or, or more days, two or three days with them learning from home. So groups A and B will also be able to engage in other activities such as sports or performing arts or, or other activities as offered at their school sites. So that is pretty much the, what the model looks like for groups A and B. We know that some of our students will not be able to be uh, returning in person. And so we're calling uh, that our group C students who will be participating in 100% distance learning uh, option which will look very familiar to them because it will be following very closely the model that they are in right now in distance learning. They will have daily live online interactions with uh, a teacher and their peers. They will have scheduled times to log on and log off and students will be learning remotely from home with some independent work and uh, our group C students will be able to participate in uh, also be able to participate in extracurricular activities if offered at their school site. With that, we can go to the next slide. So what I just shared with you apply to TK through 12. This now are, is information that applies specifically to elementary. And so for elementary, let's take a, 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 a more detailed look at the hybrid program. As already stated, this will consist of two alternating groups. The A, a group will be Monday, Thursday. The B group will be coming to school in person on Tuesdays and Friday. And both groups A and B will be online with a teacher for half the day on Wednesdays. The in-person day will begin with a daily whole class check-in, whole class meaning both the students in person and the students that are at home, um, just so that the teacher can check in with them, do some social emotional temperature checks, uh, take attendance, and really get those students started off on a good, on a, on a, with good reminders uh, for those students that are not in person, the ones that are at home. Uh, so hopefully that will get their day started on a positive note. note. Also uh, knowing that two days of in-person instruction will be with the teacher and with their peers. Uh, they will be wearing masks and they will follow social distancing and hand washing protocols so that we keep everybody safe. Uh, temperatures will be checked as they come in uh, in the morning. And the in-person day will closely follow what we fondly remember as our regular days uh, when we used to come to school every day before the pandemic. So we'll be following very closely that schedule, that daily schedule that we were familiar with before we went to distance learning. Now the at-home instructional day will start with a whole class check-in, like I said, with the, by the teacher and their peers. Uh, it will be two days of at-home learning instruction with Specialized teachers uh, providing some instruction during that day in art, music, PE, STEAM, or even enrichment. Some online learning assignments will be uh, assigned by the teacher for a pre-teaching or a reteaching of the learning that they'll be doing in class. And uh, this day, online day, will very closely follow the schedule that they are used to in distance learning currently. Now our group C students who continue on distance learning, like I have already said, will be learning online with the district teacher Monday through Friday and may be in a multi-grade class and they will follow the current distance learning schedule that we are familiar with now. So hopefully that gives you a little better idea of what the hybrid and distance learning day looks like and we can go to the next slide. Now the next slide really is a sneak peek at a day in the life of a kindergartner. And instead of me trying to pretend I'm a kindergartner missing two front teeth, we'd like you to hear directly from a couple of students who can best tell you what that day will look like in hybrid uh, when they're learning at home. Group A will be online at home day. 
Start a day check-in. I log into Zoom and check in with my teacher and classmates. My teacher takes attendance and check all my well-being and reminds me of my schedule for the day. I love seeing my classmates. Specialized teacher support. I learn about alt music, PE, STEAM, or subject i get i get to a view or preview the learning from my teacher for ela math eld science or social studies online or with written assessments learning activities with integrated social emotional learning sel i read write and play funny games solve math problems and have fun learning I, I, I integrate scientific pandemic and, and participate in creative activities like music and art, breaks and lunch. I take a break so I can stretch, get a snack or go outside. I walk with my mom to, the, to my school to pick up and grab up and grab and go lunch. Delicious. At the, end of day i make sure I, I completed all my at home work for the day and written down any questions or any exciting new learnings i want to share with my teacher the next day support i get extra support from my teachers calling quickly um specialists or a-ok -okay staff Thank you so much, boys and girls. I could not have said it better myself. And I, we miss you and we can't wait to see you back at school. So next slide. You've heard the details now. We just wanted to present yet another way of looking at the elementary hybrid model in, in a more holistic, at a glance, um, visual so that maybe this will provide you the understanding that you still need with the details uh, that that maybe uh, needed to be reinforced. So this is your at a glance elementary hybrid ABC model. Um, and it tells you a little bit that about the morning and afternoon drop off, uh, which will be staggered, of course. It tells you everything I already said with the two days in person, two days at home and half day of, of uh, with both groups online and of course our C group getting their distance learning um, from home. Now I'd like to hand it off to my partner in learning, uh, Assistant Superintendent, back to our, our Assistant Superintendent of Secondary, uh, Sean Carey. Thank you, Ms. Escobedo. Um, we want to take a similar look at the secondary model and you'll see the same kinds of formats where we describe um, what the experience will be like for students who do participate in in-person learning through the hybrid model. We're calling those group A, groups A and B again. Um, students in groups A and B will experience two days of full in-person instruction live with their teacher on campus and in their classrooms. Um, and then they'll experience two days at home doing synchronous and asynchronous learning. We heard those words earlier tonight, but some of that time while at home or learning remotely will be in real time with their teacher um, and their classmates. And that's true for every class period of every day. Um, the students on campus obviously will be um, socially distant, will be following all the safety protocols of masks, proper, proper wearing of masks, um, which we will educate and, and establish the expectations around that and enforce them, as well as hand washing. All of our secondary schools um, will be on the block schedule in the second semester. Um, and all students, whether in groups A, B, or C, will participate in a half day of Zoom learning on Wednesday mornings uh, for all of the periods in which they are enrolled. Group C students will be experiencing five days at, at home of at-home synchronous and, syn and asynchronous learning. Again, every day for every period, they will be learning um, simultaneously with and shoulder to shoulder, metaphorically speaking, with their with their peers, whether those be group A peers or group B peers. Um, and so we are, are proud to have that equivalency of learning for group C in the secondary hybrid model. I do want to point out on this slide that students who attend La Cuesta 
and Alta Vista Continuation and Alternative Schools will receive um, separate communication about the unique program features for those for those programs. There's five programs in those in those two different schools. Um, and so parents and students of those schools can expect that messaging to flow separately and in a way that is individualized to all of those programs. Um, next slide, please. Similarly, we will hear from a, uh, the voice of one of our junior high students, a student at Santa Barbara Junior High, a seventh grader. Prepare my materials in the workspace. I access my assignments and other teacher explanations for the week via NEO. Beginning at 8.30 a.m., I log into my PE class for a morning meditation and warm up. After logging off for my whole class session, I complete an online workout and log my heart rate at very intervals varying intervals in my fitness journal on NEO. I have a break between my morning classes and grab a snack. I log into my math class and review test corrections from last week. I go into a breakout group with other at-home students to write and practice novel problems about the concepts we're reviewing. I finish my math class by watching a pre-recorded video and completing guided practice. I have a 45 minute lunch, which is long enough for me to eat and take my dog for a walk. In my history class, we are presenting on historical figures using slide decks we created from a template. We practice our presentations during the first half of class and present them during the second half. I am able to participate in the theater production on campus after school. All right, thanks. It's great to hear that progression of, of development there from elementary to junior high. And we'll have one more of those for you just in a moment. Um, next slide, we'll show you the junior high school schedule. And of note here, it's, it's important. I know it looks like a lot of text, but I wanna really point out a couple of things. One is where you see um, the, the class period schedule, you'll see period one slash two. And I wanna make sure that everyone is clear that we are setting up a system in which the odd numbered class periods will run during the third quarter of the school year. So beginning in January and extending through February and March to spring break. And the even numbered courses will take place during fourth quarter of our school year. So after spring break and through June 2nd. Um, we're doing that because six, uh, there are six classes in our, in our junior highs and by splitting our six classes into those two groups of three, um, that will allow for deeper learning, safer conditions on campus in person um, and closer relationships between students, teachers and peers. Um, I do wanna also point out that most, the vast majority of our, of our junior high students have again those six classes all year long but some of our students do have a zero period and or a seventh period. So note that the times for, for period zero and for period seven are in parentheses. We did wanna reflect those on the schedule so that we are put it, putting that information out. And you'll also note that those are shorter class periods um, on this version of the schedule because those may run all semester long. Although we, we may see some variability there that depending on the course or depending on the site. But again, that's not a majority of our junior high students. We just wanted to be able to, to represent that. Um, you'll see that there are opportunities for learning support both on Wednesday afternoons, um, as well as daily after school. Um, and also a, a call out there to the co-curricular opportunities that we, we hope to be able to expand um, even before January 19th, but certainly this schedule is representing um, at the beginning of second semester. We can shift now to high school and we'll hear the voice of a, of a high school student tell us about a day in the life of a, of, a, of a sample 11th grader. A day in my life as an 11th grader in an at-home learning day. I prepare my materials and workspace. I access my assignments and other teachers' expectations for the week via NEO. Beginning at 9 a.m., I log into my English class for 20 minutes and my teacher introduces a unit on persuasive writing to the class. I complete research associated with my chosen persuasive essay topic and upload my research notes to my writer's portfolio in Neo. I have a 15 minute break between my morning classes. Beginning at 10.35 a.m., I log into my second period biology class to review the structure we are using for our lab reports before completing assigned reading and uploading notes to Neo. 
I have a 45 minute lunch, which is long enough for me to eat and have an appointment with my counselor about a college application workshop. I have AP Spanish third period, and we are collaborating virtually in small groups on a script for a mock TV commercial. We record and share our commercial with the class as a whole during the last half of the class. I am able to participate in gem life practice on campus. All right, thank you for that. And if we can take a look at the high school schedule, um, you will similarly see uh, the block periods. Uh, this time for four periods each day, many students will have three classes at a time um, and on occasion fewer or more. Um, same thing where we have the parentheses around zero period. We have a small number of, of zero period courses that we run at our three traditional high school sites. I do want to um, use this slide to talk again about the group C students and the fact that on Wednesday in the morning, they will have a, an experience that is equivalent to the group A and B students because, and they'll be, they'll be there right, right there with them. And then on the two days a week, um, they will be doing the same types of assignments that students in groups A and B have on their at-home days, their days away from campus. The remaining two days a week, group C students will have um, asynchronous work that um, they can access through NEO and that will be done to some degree um, independently and asynchronously. However, I wanna emphasize what you see at the bottom of the high school schedule as well as at the bottom of the junior high schedule and that is that minimum of 20 minutes daily per class period of all students in groups A, B and C together in real time and with it with their teacher. Um, Wednesdays do um, necessitate a, a slightly higher number of asynchronous minutes in order to, to meet state minimums there, uh, but there's a shortened day on, on Zoom on Wednesdays. Um, at this time, I will hand it over to, I believe to Dr. Wagenig. Thank you for your attention to the secondary hybrid model. All right, uh, thank you, Ms. Carey. Um, during this difficult time, um, and all, you know, it always takes a village to raise students. And during this difficult time, that's absolutely necessary. Um, and it should always be each family's expectation that their child is known by their face and their name and as individuals and distance learning makes that harder and which is why we are diligently planning for the return to school on January 19th. In the meantime, um, knowing that many children are children and youth are struggling um, with their mental wellness and their social emotional well-being, we've increased the availability of services for our students, our staff, and our families through Calm in elementary school and Family Service Agency in secondary. If anyone needs help, all they have to do is ask. Please do not hesitate. Um, we have programming that we have added that um, is being underutilized. So that's both for students and for parents and as well for staff. And so Calm offers parent office hours with their licensed therapists weekly at each elementary school site. So contact your principal if you're interested in participating or if you're hesitant to, to talk with the principal for any reason, um, you can email me um, here at the district office and I'll facilitate that for you. Now for families with students in grades seven through 12, Family Service Agency offers um, regular uh, district-wide parent webinars in both English and Spanish. They also offer monthly coffee chats over Zoom for parents to meet and get tips from licensed therapists um, about supporting their teens. Um, these are on our district website, on our master calendar. They're listed there. So all of these opportunities from Family Services Agency and Calm are listed there. And in terms of your own children, please, I, I encourage you to contact uh, a school administrator or a school counselor tomorrow if your child is struggling. There is help. It's absolutely free of charge for all students and um, they are there to help. So please reach out. And now uh, we will hear from Dr. Becchio. 
All right, thank you, Dr. Wegnick, and good evening, board members. I wanted to bring you uh, tonight a hiring update. As you know, last um, board meeting, I put together some numbers of positions that we anticipated needing as we uh, return to in-person school. You'll see the, the chart on the left, um, it depicts that, gives you the numbers of those positions and the numbers that we're looking to hire. Um, it really actually isn't a surprise at this point to have no one hired into those positions because it's um, really not possible to uh, do the recruiting, get the applications, do the interviews, and then um, get someone cleared and actually hired. So um, that's not too alarming, but I did also include here a graphic that demonstrates our current applicants for those positions. And so um, you'll see that there's um, not a lot of applicants for those positions. That That isn't actually surprising to us, but we did um, expand our outreach for these um, job postings beyond what we normally do, which is add join and our website and internal job boards. And so to be more aggressive with our recruitment efforts, uh, we posted at all the college job boards. We um, had a print ad uh, recently and it's still running in the independent. We posted on social media. Uh, we have a posting actually in Craigslist and we've pushed out a, a job flyer to our labor partners who um, have agreed to distribute those widely and also to our principals, which um, actually for uh, these positions uh, that are part-time, three to five hours, the principals are a very good resource to, to shoulder tap people that they know in their school communities that might be interested in applying. They are short-term positions, so uh, we do know that these are gonna be difficult to fill and for that reason, we are currently designing an alternative plan to make sure that if we don't fill every position, we still have the ability to, to get staff in the, in the right places at schools um, in order to implement the hybrid model and all that we need to do in that. Um, so I can bring more information on that plan as we develop it further. Another important point to make uh, on the topic of staffing though, is that we do expect official paperwork to come in from staff members by November 9th. Um, and, and those staff members will indicate um, in that paperwork if they are not able to return to in-person work. And then that data will um, inform us on what our true staffing needs really will be as we return to in-person. And that's a hiring update. So I'd like to now turn it over to, again, to Anna Escobedo. Thank you, Dr. Becchio. So, how exactly have we, have we been able to accomplish all the many things you just heard about? Uh, as Dr. Wagonet reminded us, it truly does take a village, especially when we speak of education. And we are so grateful uh, to our re-entry advisory teams who, who at each school site have worked in partnership with our principals to provide guidance and ensure that we get input from all stakeholders with weekly or bi-monthly meetings and these meetings will continue these tasks these uh, teams will continue to meet until we we get to our hybrid reopening and they also uh, not just provide input and perspective but they also serve as our ambassadors uh, for our school communities. And, and again, we are so uh, incredibly thankful to them and for their time um, and for their patience with us um, because it, it really has been um, a team effort as, as everything is in education. And uh, we look forward to continuing to hear from uh, those teams and all of the unofficial teams that are convening at the school sites. So to talk a little bit more about that communication and how that's happening after those teams convene, I'm gonna hand it back to Sean Carey. Thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to emphasize here the variety of methods by which our principals are reaching out to connect with families, students, and staff. Um, we're very appreciative of our principals' efforts, both um, push and pull communication. We've developed tools um, such as pre-recorded videos, FAQ documents, um, other resources on, on both the district website and, and through school web websites that are more static and that families and staff can return to again and again. Um, although, as we've said tonight, we always need to make sure we're maintaining up updated, updated information in those tools, but also all of the real-time opportunities, whether it's through coffees with the principal or 
um, meetings um, that, that folks can sign on to, to have Q and A's after they've viewed webinars. I see the principal Zoom chats there. Um, and there, that's all in addition to the formal governance structures that help support ongoing parent engagement. And you'll see several of those listed here as well. So thanks very much uh, both to our principals and to their respective school communities for continuing to engage with us in two-way communication as we, as we educate um, and keep everyone current and informed about our planning and as we continue to take from you your input. And with that, I'll turn it back over to our superintendent, Ms. Maldonado. Thank you, cabinet and uh, board members. That ends our presentation. Uh, I know that we're turning over to public comment and then we'll take your questions. Thank you to the team and we'll turn it over to public comment. I wanna make one comment about public comment. I've gotten some questions. How do people get selected for public comment? Uh, there is no selection, all are welcome. So we do not screen or handpick or anything like this. It's just people who sign up. So with that, I just will turn it over to Ms. Trujillo to welcome our public comment speakers for this agenda item. After we're done with the reopening plan discussion, we will go to public comment on non-agenda items. But again, there is uh, no screening or selection. These are just anybody who wants to speak is given the opportunity. Thanks so much. Thank you, President Capps. Good evening, members of the board. We have 10 um, speakers for this item. I will call the first five. Uh, Sanita Beal, York Shingle, Caroline Hera, Charity Dubberley, and Virginia Alvarez. I will start with Sanita Beal. Hello. Sanita, can you hear us? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Good evening, board members. My name is Sunita Beal, and I'm a parent of two students in the Santa Barbara Unified School District. I would like to continue the discussion in regard to returning to in-person instruction in the red tier. As you know, the tiering was put in place by Governor Newsom in July of this year, when much of the state was experiencing a spike in COVID infections after restrictions had been eased. His goal was to make the counties responsible for managing their own infection rates by restricting access to public sites and large gatherings. But his main goal was to restrict businesses that were not essential, not only because they could be sites of infection, but also because these businesses were important for the economy in these counties. And quite simply, money is a great motivator for change. And we did it. We went from purple to red tier. And it is increasingly clear that we are going to stay in the red tier. There are pockets of infection with the college students in Isla Vista and the communities in Santa Maria and Lompoc the students and families in the Santa Barbara School District are not driving the red tier. The tiers were never meant to hold schools hostage. That is why Governor Newsom allowed waivers in the purple tier for vulnerable elementary school students and all schools were allowed to return to in-person instruction in the red tier. We already know that it is not realistic to expect a sustained orange tier this winter. The difference at worst between the orange and red tier is 14 new infections a day out of 446,900 people. Please do not take an economic restriction and apply it to education. Many local schools have returned to in-person learning in the red tier, and there have been no outbreaks. 462 students have disenrolled from the school district, and we are not even halfway through the year. If we do not return to school in January for this entire academic year, students will not have had in-person instruction for 15 months. I ask you, Laura Capps, Dr. Jacqueline Reed, Rose Munoz, Kate Ford, Wendy sims Moten, and Supervisor Hilda Maldonado, is this the legacy you would like to leave? Are you going to wonder in the future with all the evidence around you for good local conditions why schools were not reopened more quickly? I know these are strong words, but I do not know any other way to motivate the board to move forward in returning to in-person learning. In that vein, I'm asking you to decide to make the decision tonight to open in the red tier in January. Deciding to open in the red tier is a decision to move forward rather than stand still. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is York Shingle. Good evening, Superintendent Maldonado, board and cabinet. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. As a teacher at La Cumbre Junior High, I'm very concerned about this hybrid model and the process of how it's been delivered and developed. I want to be clear that I'm not opposed to going back into the classroom, but I want to make sure it's a safe return and that we're going back to a program worth returning for. 
um, the, about the process. I've sent each of you a letter outlining my concerns with how this was rolled out and how I don't feel anyone at my school is being heard. That letter represented more than 15 voices who were comfortable speaking out. I'm not gonna go through those points because you already have them. One thing I would like to add is that I keep hearing from people in this meeting, we kind of have to take things day by day and that things are changing all the time. Yet in the district's timeline, families have to decide next week, which is an election week, an election that's gonna be very difficult for a lot of families, uh, what they're gonna be comfortable with two months from now. That's unrealistic. Uh, next, I wanna talk about the schedule. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. This schedule is a nightmare. Splitting the junior high into separate block quarters is incredibly difficult to manage since student schedules are already set. My students in math support class might be currently enrolled in their core math class for the quarter, but they might not have it till fourth quarter. So my students in the same class are gonna be in dramatically different parts of their learning journey. In addition to figuring that out, I'll have some of them in the classroom and some at home. And I'm supposed to develop a rigorous expectation for them. For one quarter, I'm gonna teach all day without a prep, period zero, one, three, and five, and have to split between students in the classroom and on Zoom. And somehow it's gonna be rigorous? That's only a manageable schedule right now because I'm doing it twice a week. But for a whole quarter, it's gonna burn me out because of the decisions you're making about the model. When it comes to safety, I am worried about passing periods. Students are supposed to help us clean. Have you seen how well a seventh grader cleans? I love them to pieces, but spoiler alert, they're not good at it. It's gonna take multiple efforts to actually disinfect the desk. Meanwhile, I'm also supposedly helping supervise an indoor hallway that's about 15 feet wide. Hundreds of students will be traveling to and from their classes and lining up outside of classrooms. There's not enough space for two directions of travel and lines of students on each side trying to maintain social distancing. By the end of my four periods that I'll be teaching, which is gonna be brutal, I will have way more than just 60 student contacts. Uh, I understand that many specifics are hard to figure out, but that's an issue that's gonna happen at every school with indoor hallways. So I started looking at the frequently asked questions to try to ease my fears. But some of the answers are incredibly insufficient. For example, 27 says, what happens if a student or staff member is positive for COVID-19? The response is, our will collaborate with county public health. That's not enough. We Hi. need specifics. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is Caroline Hara. Caroline, can you hear us? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I couldn't find my unmute button. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, good evening. My name is Caroline Hara, and I'm speaking tonight both as a parent of a seventh grader and a senior, as well as the founder of SB Plan. Thank you, all of you, for your service and dedication to our children. It is clear that you care and that you are interested in understanding the myriad issues impacting families. I also appreciate those of you who have taken the time to speak directly to the parents on the SB Plan Facebook group. You might have seen today's News Hawk, Hawk article in which I am quoted. I'd like to take this time to reinforce and clarify my message about the hybrid model proposed. SB Plan was formed three months ago to represent the diverse needs of Santa Barbara's families, teachers, and schools faced with the uncertainty and challenges related to COVID. We are dedicated to promoting safety, equity, and choice, and again, to support our school community. We have demonstrated our support and respect for all perspectives repeatedly in both words and actions. Regarding SB Unified's proposed hybrid model, I said, and I reiterate, that the current hybrid model represents a fair compromise to parent and teacher feedback. And I applaud you all for your efforts on this. I'm sure it was not easy to assimilate the feedback from so many diverse constituencies so swiftly and thoughtfully. In speaking to the matter of choice, I said that SB Plan members, and I clarify, with whom I've spoken who, and who have expressed strong preference for the hybrid in-person option, they generally feel that it is safe to return to school in the red tier based on the proposed model and safety procedures developed by district leaders and staff, and that such a plan should proceed in January, even if we are still in the red tier. 
I did not say, nor do I believe, that anyone should be pressured into opening school as soon as possible or going back to school in general. However, school is currently operating in the red tier throughout Santa Barbara. For families who prefer that choice, a January start is reasonable. Regarding the option presented for those who choose to continue to learn from home, I am pleased that initial concerns about the potential of losing connection to homeschool teachers and classmates were addressed and that you have increased the days of instruction to five days along with frequent teacher check-ins. Many with whom I've spoken, parents and teachers are pleased with the new model. No option is perfect, but your proposal once again is a more than fair compromise. No option is perfect and no time will be perfect. I would like to see the district adopt the current hybrid remote plan proposed and work towards implementing it now so that we are ready for students in January. I understand that there remains a big question about what will happen should we not reach the orange tier by January. Parents and teachers with whom I've spoken do not want to wait until January for a new or contingency plan. They would like a plan now that considers all scenarios and looks at all relevant metrics, including the health and safety of teachers and students, as well as the impact further delay will have on mental wellness, education loss, truancy, and dropouts. There is a saying, all paths kneel before decisive minds. The time is now to formalize our plan. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sherry Deberly. My name is Charity Deberly. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and to the teachers and schools for their ongoing hard work. I am a parent of a first grader at Washington and I have three requests. First, please allow teachers to meet with small cohorts of their students outside throughout the week starting now. Spending one to two hours with his teacher and peers even once a week would be a huge benefit and very low risk to students and teachers for transmission who choose to do so. Second, please allow, oh, sorry. Please allow schools to open in the red tier in January as permitted by Governor Newsom. I feel that the safety measures of mask wearing, social distancing, and the hygiene measures in place at the schools will be effective in the red tier. Lastly, if the county is not in the red tier on January 19th, please provide parents with options other than 100% remote learning via Zoom. Right now, our only choices are full remote learning or to leave the school. We need to be working towards getting children off Zoom and more opportunities for in-person learning. This could be through an asynchronous learning agreement currently not offered where parents can choose to reduce the amount of time spent in front of Zoom and instead allow children to work with an adult offline under their teacher's direction. This would give parents more choice for their child's education within the district. Our family has worked very hard to keep our kids off screens for most of their lives. And while remote learning is working fairly well for us, I feel the current moder model is requiring far too much screen time for young children. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Virginia Alvarez. Yes, hi, good evening. Board members, superintendent, cabinet members, and member of the public. My name is Virginia Alvarez, and I'm a candidate for the Santa Barbara School Board. I'm here to thank the Santa Barbara Unified Teachers and staff members for their work and efforts to organize remote instruction and towards the reopening of schools. I know from experience the work that this entails. A special thank you to the care professionals that are working in person with the small cohorts at the schools the facilities and maintenance staff, the food services members, and the clerical staff that are working at the sites. Thank you very much. I am grateful for your work. I see you and I appreciate you. Buenas noches a todos. Soy Virginia Álvarez y soy candidata para la mesa directiva. Aprovecho esta oportunidad para darle las gracias a los maestros y otros empleados del distrito escolar por sus esfuerzos en organizar la instrucción remota y para abrir de nuevo las escuelas en un futuro cercano. Yo sé de experiencia el esfuerzo que esto requiere. Gracias especialmente a los ayudantes de maestros que están trabajando con grupos pequeños de estudiantes en las escuelas. 
gracias a los empleados de oficina, mantenimiento, los conserjes y de servicios de alimentos que han trabajado continuamente en las escuelas. Les agradezco mucho y los aprecio. Gracias y buenas noches. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Our next five speakers are Charles Clout, Ivan Genove, Elrod McLaurin, Jake Mar Marciak, and Karen McBride. And Charles Claw, go ahead. Good evening, board members, district cabinet, superintendent, and community. I'm speaking tonight to provide a teacher's point of view on the proposed hybrid learning schedule. I'm a teacher at a high school in the district and having reviewed the proposed schedule, I'm noticing some of the same issues that Maya and Yaritza spoke to at the beginning of the meeting. I'm going to speak on issues more pertinent to teachers, but I'd like to say at the start that like board member Reed said, it's encouraging to see student activism and student voices, especially in such challenging times. More germane to tonight's agenda though, is this specific schedule, which simply put, isn't feasible. Differentiating over Zoom is challenging enough in a fully remote model. Asking teachers to differentiate over Zoom and do so in the classroom simultaneously is not a realistic expectation. Further, I'm not sure the community knows how difficult this ask is. I'm one of 10 people speaking tonight, which tells me that the community is either confused or undecided about this schedule which is concerning given next week's impending deadline. I'm here to tell you, this is not some dynamic new opportunity. Student engagement might go up relative to online only school, but holding students accountable to the rigor level we would expect from normal in-person school is a mistake. We are still in a pandemic. Some projections show that by our proposed hybrid reopening date, as many as 400,000 Americans could have died from COVID-19. The trauma for that staggering loss of life won't be solved by having students attend in-person school twice per week. Let me close by saying I am eager to return to school. I love my job and interacting with students is the best part of my job. Zoom only school is challenging for all of us, but candidly, I don't see how this schedule makes things better for our students. We can do better. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ivan Genov. Hello, uh, my name is Ivan. Uh, I'm a parent of two kids who attend Gulita Valley Junior High. So I have prepared four questions. So the first one was about the block schedule for junior high students. I was going to ask what the reason for it is and whether it is necessary, which you already provided uh, an explanation for that. So it's not much left from the question to ask now, but I want to express my concern that, for example, students who have PE the first two months will have no PE the last two months of school. I would prefer if they have regular physical activity the whole time, or they would have math for two months and then no math for the last two months of school. My concern is that they would have a big gap of no math or any subject until they start their next grade. So I wanted to provide uh, my feedback and hope that a solution can be found where students have all the periods like they have them now. So question number two is, are you going to try to fit siblings who go to the same school in the same group? So if we choose the hybrid model, we would prefer them to go to school together in the same days. Question number three is about the buses. I know that some bus lines stopped service due to the schools being closed. Will they resume normal service once the schools are reopened for hybrid? And question number four is, uh, so the FAQ mentions that in limited cases, teachers would be at home while the students would be at school. So can you, provide, can you provide more information on that? For example, is it possible that my kids would have two of their periods out of the three periods in a day where the teacher is at home? If that is possible, can you have this information uh, for our kids teachers in advance before we make the election next week? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elrod McLearn.
Hello. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, uh, board and community members that are uh, tuning in. I think for starters, it is wonderful that we have such a big parent community teacher involvement in this whole issue. And I, I see that that has really brought us to the place where, where we're at now. There's a ton of work that needs to be done uh, and we're not there yet, but it's encouraging to me to see all the parents and the community members that are involved uh, in, in this process. Uh, but I will say what we need to do is it's, as what we're seeing with our metrics, it's probably not likely that we will be open um, or we will be at the orange tier come January. And are you current board members willing to commit to opening in the red tier? Uh, according to the science, according to the state health department, according to our county health department, uh, we are allowed to open now in the red tier. And it seems like we will be there in the red tier coming up in January. So can we have a committed plan to open in the red tier? Because as we talked a lot about in this meeting and we heard earlier, a lot of the mental health risks, uh, the disparities that are happening, parents and families that can are leaving the district, which is increasing the inequalities among the learning of our students and the, those families. So we need to have a commitment to opening regardless of what tier we're in as allowed part of the state in January. Uh, thank you all for listening to me and uh, have a good night. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jake Mar Marciak. You Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, right, thanks uh, for your time, everybody. And thanks to the board and the supervisor for having uh, leading this forum and given the community an opportunity to speak. Uh, I just want to, you know, a lot of the uh, speakers before me, you know, said it a lot better than I can. But I think the the metric and the red tier is uh, where the focus is. Uh, we would like, obviously, for the kids to go back full time all the time and. I think the parents probably had an unrealistic expectation that we'd be ready to go and hit the ground as soon as the state allowed us to do that. Um, now that I've looked into, you know, got more educated on the plan, uh, it's, you know, it's good. I, I, anything is better than what's going on now. I think, you know, our kids were, were having way too much screen time uh, a year ago, you know, when they were just doing normal school. Now the amount of screen time they're having is just, just unhealthy. Uh, and I want to, you know, remind everybody that on, so that according to the county's metrics right now, uh, there are in the South County, the city of Santa Barbara and Goleta, which, you know, generally represents the Santa Barbara Unified School District population, there's 16 individuals with active COVID. And there's 14, over 14,000 students that are being affected by this. There is zero COVID patients in the cottage hospital right now yet there are 14,000 students being negatively affected. So, um, you know, let's be smart. Let's look at the numbers. We have great resources within this county. We have a lot of smart people with all the institutions of higher learning supporting us. Uh, we can do this. So please, I re reiterate uh, the, the last speaker and we would like a commitment by the board to open no matter if we're in the red tier or gold tier come January. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker is Karen McBride. Uh, good evening, um, members of the board and um, district staff. Um, I just wanna uh, make a few comments tonight. First, I want to say thank you, Fran uh, Wagonek, for the update on the progress of small cohorts. I've been hearing a lot of um, a lot of things from different school sites, and I um, I got the sense that things were changing. So I appreciate the update. Um, I I hope that information will be part of Ms. Maldonado's report to the staff in the coming week. Um, and uh, I also want to thank. Uh, um, Dr. Reed for acknowledging the creativity and professionalism of educators and their ability to be part of the solution and 
And I agree with the speakers that have come before us that are before me that, you know, it, it's been a really a collective effort. It's been great to see kids involved in the conversation. It's been great to, to um, see different groups of parents involved. Um, but I do want to make a couple of comments and that is, I want to respond to something that I've been hearing and that is people who have said that, um, you know, teachers are frontline workers like grocery store clerks and bank tellers, et cetera. And, and I want to make sure that it's really clear to people that a bank teller has plexiglass between them and a, and a customer, and they are in contact for maybe 10 minutes. Same with a grocery store, grocery store clerk. They're working in spaces that are tens of thousands of square feet. Being in a classroom with students over a 60 to 80 minute period of time is a very different experience. And um, so it makes perfect sense that we have taken the time to plan. And I also appreciate the depth of tonight's board report from the district staff and Superintendent Maldonado presenting the many layers of, of difficulties and, and changes and pivots that um, we as educators have and, and the administrators have had to make. Um, it's kind of like turning a giant ship, you know, it takes time. And then all of a sudden something is in the way in the course and you have to, you have to tack, you have to change course. And so, it makes sense that we are planning this methodically. We are taking a long time to do it. Um, I, and I actually don't believe that it's a long time. I think it's a reasonable amount of time. So I wanted to put that out there. And um, I wanted to say to the last speaker and, and anybody else who is thinking along this lines, you have to remember that maybe one of the reasons the statistics have been so, so good and we are approaching orange is because we have had safe practices. And the fear is that if we bring these large groups of kids back together again and, and educators on campuses, et cetera, it's going to you know, increase the chance of spread. So I just wanted to put that out there and appreciate the, the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. And President Capps, that concludes public comment. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Superintendent Maldonado, is there anything you want to clarify before we turn it over to the board? I'm good, thank you. Okay, thanks. Well, I'm gonna take liberty to ask a few questions. Um, I have a questions about the tiers, questions about hybrid, and questions about hiring. So those are my three categories. I think the threshold question that's before us has been raised in public comment and in the many, many letters we've received since the last uh, meeting about January 19th. I appreciate Superintendent Maldonado, your messaging about all systems go for January 19th. I think that's crucial because planning, we need some certainty in this very uncertain world of when to hire, how this is going to work, how the time frame timelines will work. And so I just wanna clarify because um, it was confusing admittedly the, the recommendation and the motion that we passed included the phrase January 19th comma when we project to be in orange. And so certainly over the last few weeks, people have interpreted it differently and wondered where we stand. And I think it's really important for us to, dis to discuss this and clarify. I personally will speak and would like to ask the question of, of you, Superintendent, and, and perhaps Susan Klein-Rothschild too. Um, I think it's important that we move forward to January 19th as the time that we move to hybrid. Of course, uh, the expectation and the hope is that we will be in orange, but if we are close to orange, I believe we should proceed. We should also, of course, as, as we would, we can reassess, but I don't want that reassessment to hinder any of the planning. So again, I appreciate this all systems go mentality because we need that. And you all are working hard, but we need to have uh, these time frames, have a deadline, have a goal. And so moving forward with a January 19th hybrid approach is where I am. Um, of course, if we're in purple or we have a major outbreak in South County, we will reassess, but I want us to be moving towards that goal that we that we voted on two weeks ago 
of January 19th, comma, when we expect to be in orange. If we're not in orange, if we've been on the cusp like we are now, I believe we should proceed. So I just want to get any feedback that you might have uh, to that clarification. Certainly other board members now in this public forum can weigh in as well when it's their time to speak. But uh, Superintendent Maldonado or Susan Klein Rothschild, um, if you'd like to speak to that, I would appreciate it. Thank you for that question. I'd like to say that uh, we are planning as if we're opening on January 19th. We are weighing all the, all the differences between what red means and what orange means as we look at the metrics as Susan Klein Rothschild has said, stated. The positivity case rate is the only thing that's holding us back from being in orange, perhaps a more of a Pollyanna and expect that we will get there. And uh, you know, I'm optimistic that with everybody working together, we'll achieve that. So I'm working with the team, as you can see, to get us to open on January 19th. I would like to hear from other board members as to any changes that we would like to make if they would like to have staff move to say that uh, you want us to open even if we're in red, then we will make it happen. As we continue to look at the feasibility with staffing, with hiring, with facilities, with making sure that everybody not only understands what we need to do, but feels that we are ready as we hear from teachers, as we hear from others uh, about whether they feel we're ready, whether they agree with our plans or not, we still need to move the whole system over to this idea that we are opening. So um, I would like to have us listen to all, all board members and we serve at the pleasure of the board. Whatever you would like us to do is what we're prepared for. Thank you for that. And I just want to, again, just clarify, because you put it in communications, which I agree with, that we will have a special meeting January 4th. But some have interpreted that in their letters to us, that we're going to somehow delay and not plan until January 4th or reassess then. Can you just speak to that? Because I know, I think I'm kind of setting you up here to affirmatively say that a Janu January 4th is merely a check-in and a reassessment for the January 19th opening. The way that we have scheduled our meetings, uh, the schedule was set in, in for these meetings, obviously back in June or May. Um, we only have one meeting in November. We only have one more meeting in December. Yes. And then we have a winter break of three weeks. And our next bo scheduled board meeting is January 12th, which is a week before the 19th. I'm asking if the board members agree to schedule another meeting January 5th, so we can continue to reassess each time we meet as we have throughout these months with um, Susan Klein Rothschild informing us of where we are so that we just continue to monitor. We've never had to open schools with <laughs> monitoring from a public health department. And so the intent of the January 5th meeting is to just continue to solidify our reopening plans look at where we are and continue to inform you as our progress is moving forward. There is no question in anybody on this cabinet's mind that we are, we believe the, the best education is with the teacher in person, but we are realistic about the fact that it's gotta be socially distanced and that there are families whose health conditions will not allow them to be in person. So I wanna make sure that we continue to emphasize um, that is all of the complexities beyond just whether it's red, orange, or gold. And I believe Susan would like to also comment. Thank you, Superintendent. I just wanted to say we are fortunate that we have a number of things to help us along the way. One, we have this State Department of Public Health that gives us a reading every week. That will be continuing on a weekly basis to continue to monitor to know what's going on. We know what the behaviors are and the actions that we can all take to impact that. Two, we have a number of schools in Santa Barbara County that are already open at, for in-person learning. We can learn from those schools. We can learn from other schools that have done that. And I think that will benefit your board and your school district. And as Santa Barbara Unified continues to have more small cohorts, there's an opportunity to learn from those experiences too. So I feel like between now and January, you will have a lot of data about what is and is not happening that the whole community will have and know that will help your community and your board make decisions. Thank you so much, uh, Susan Klein Rothschild. I, you just have been such a valuable asset to us throughout this whole process, and thank you for that. Um, I want to take the liberty. I, so I just want to re again restate that 
the data is coming in and the reassessment will happen, but that doesn't stop any planning. So just I'm being very clear because again, the nature of some questions have been in that regard, like, oh, let's not wait till January 4th, but, but mm -hmm. all systems go as we reassess that's the that's the uh, the modus operandi here, and I'm going to take um, the liberty of of getting a because I do believe this is a threshold question for this board meeting. If we can get uh, the comments of, bo of board members, I do have other questions, and I'm sure you have other questions as well. But if we can stop here and other board members who might want to weigh in, because again, I think we do owe it to the public to clarify this because it wasn't exactly as clear as we had hoped it to be in our vote two weeks ago. Anyone else would like to speak? Ms. Sims Moten. Uh, thank you, President Caps. I, I don't know. I, I really was of the mindset. I wasn't confused last week. I was <laughs> of the mindset that we were going January 19th and that we we're going to be working toward that goal because what was confusing was we had two dates, right? We and Superintendent Maldonado said, you know, let me add this date because we still need some planning. We need some hiring. So a lot of things that need to happen. So we were we were looking at. November 9th, people were expecting that, people were upset about that. And so we figured out as we talked and deliberated as a board, we said January 19th will give you the time needed, you know, to make all the adjustments along the way, listen, listen and assess the data, listen to the feedback that's coming back from parents, teachers, and also the students. And so I was of the mindset, then of the mindset that January 19th is our go date. And we're gonna be moving whatever we need to do to make sure that we get there. Of course, again, if it's purple, that's a whole different story, but it doesn't change January 19th because as it's, it's, it's long as we have a date that everybody's moving towards that everybody can understand their role to get us there, right? And so as we're reassessing and talking and having those conversations, January 19th, as far as in my mind, that's the goal. And I didn't even, I guess either missed the, if we get into orange, <laughs> totally didn't see that, but I was about January 19th and what it needed and the time why we were changing from the November 9th to the January 19th was where I was focused on, right? And so, because we need a little bit more time to do and adjust and make all the schedules and take into consideration that the things that have happened thus far that you put in your presentation tonight. So I'm, I'm of January 19th. And if it's safe to do so, and I appreciate the information that Susan just, you know, just shared in terms of, we've already got examples, how we can do it, how we can do it better, taking the data and do it. So I, I'm January 19th. Uh, in terms of doing that. And so that way, everybody knows what they need to do. Parents can make their decisions in terms of they know it's January 19th, that's where we're going, and they can determine that they need to come back, you know, based on their individual uh, decisions and, you know, uh, uh, conditions to do so. Teachers now know it's November 19th, excuse me, it's January 19th. We know what we need to do in, in, in terms of that. And we need to have that clarity. And I, I appreciate you, President Caps, keep, you know, reiterating. This is clear about this. This is January 19th. This is our go date. We're reassessing. It doesn't mean that we're changing that date. It's just we want to make sure we have the best information. We have the best conditions to meet that, that January 19th goal. So that's where I am uh, on that piece. And I've kind of always been there. I just totally blocked out the tier thing because I was figured we've got examples to go. We've got schools that are going on. And also that we were continuing to have small cohorts coming and, and you know, along the way. And so we're learning what we need to do and adjust and adapt to make sure that folks are safe. So I'm January 19th. Got it. Thanks, Ms. Simzoten. Dr. Reed. Thank you. And um, yes, I, I will speak to this. I, I, I'm on the same level as you, Ms. Caps, and as Ms. Sims Moten. I assume January 19th was the day that we would be launching the hybrid model. The fact that our parents have the options to make choices about that model and have it laid out, though I have many questions, um, that they have the opportunity to have it laid out and see what those options are for their families and for their students is, is crucial. And that's what we have. So in my opinion, um, January 19th is where we should go, that we should be strategic in all of our efforts, like really thinking ahead in terms of staffing. I think we should have staffing on the bench waiting to be prepared. I don't think we should wait until, you know, January 4th to hire people. We need to just be proactive. And I have I, questions and ideas about that. So to be very, to just, you know, stop because I know everyone wants to speak about it. Yes, January 19th, move full speed ahead, carefully and methodically. And as you've mentioned, if we go into purple, um, then I don't know. Actually, that's a question for Ms. Um, 
Uh, Klein Rothschild, if we were to go into purple in January, um, and because you have said that once we make the decision to go hybrid, that it wouldn't be that we would go back to full remote, that we would do more larger extensive testing and more um, and different types of testing to, to eliminate and to um, rid the chances of more um, breakouts. So I would like to just ask you if we were to go in purple in January, um, what would that do to our opening in a hybrid model? The State Department of Public Health has been clear that if you've already had in-person learning, whether that be hybrid or full-time, you may continue if we go back into purple at that time. However, if you had not started in-person learning and we were in purple, then you cannot begin it at that point in time. You could begin it in red or any other color, but not in purple. Only if you had already opened a school for in-person learning, could you continue it that way? Okay, so just to clarify that January 25th, we open January 19th in hybrid. January 25th, we go to purple. We would not go back to remote. We would stay in hybrid and keep moving forward. That's correct. Okay, so based on that information, if prior to January 19th, we find we're in purple, then we need to rescope and think about when we would launch the hybrid. Otherwise, we move full speed ahead for January 19th. Got it. Okay, thanks, Dr. Reed. Um, any other board members want to weigh in here or ask questions? Again, just specifically on <laughs> this clarification of our vote two weeks ago, Ms. Ford. Uh, thanks so much. I'm in general agreement with my fellow board members. I, um, I'm very concerned about us uh, having some consistency, having some dates uh, set, and that date is January 19th. I did understand the condition of orange, but I'm feeling so much more comfortable now with the red as I look around our community and I see people are really trying hard. I know the hospitalizations are, uh, are near zero, if not zero, and the cases are very low. If we can keep this going, I feel comfortable starting school in red. Um, I think that also educators really need to know what's uh, going on before January. So. I, I think there are all kinds of ways, and we had a number of people suggest to us different ways to look at it, but I'm, I'm even thinking that if, we're, uh, if we maintain red through December 1st, uh, that we can make a commitment to going back to school in red so that people even know just now or very soon uh, what the plans are. I think that the uncertainty does not help our community, it doesn't help the parent community, and it really doesn't help teachers to make the decisions. So I know you didn't ask this, Ms. Caps, but I really do think that we should expand the dates that people can respond and make choices so that there is, um, uh, I think that the next week is going to be tumultuous at, at a minimum, and it might be very, uh, very weird and super crazy, depending on what happens with the election. And uh, I just would like people to have more opportunity to, to change their mind. I'm also very much concerned about the dogmatic uh, way of saying, if you make this decision, you have to stay there. If you make this decision, you have to stay there. I really think that we've said over and over how uncertain everything is. So we don't know exactly what will happen, except we should say, January 19th, we're going back to school unless we're in purple. And also Dr. Reed, we can always decide to go back uh, to distance learning as a board. Uh, you've seen that in the state of Idaho and in the state of Massachusetts, that the, the infections were so serious and the death rates were so um, concerning that they went backwards. So we can make that decision as a board also. Thanks Ms. Ford. Ms. Munoz. Yes, I also um, feel like the, you know, I understood it from the last meeting 
from our vote that we would be going back to hybrid um, January 19th um, and that that was clear. Um, also, you know, appreciate the um, uh, feedback from Ms. Klein Rothschild about the tiers, you know, and, and um, depending on how we are when we start. Um, I'm also supportive of, you know, if we're in the red tier going back to school January 19th, um, unless there is a, you know, a drastic change. Um, I think that I agree that the parents, you know, the students themselves, um, the teachers and the, the community want to plan around this. And I know that, you know, um, the superintendent and the cabinet have are, are moving forward with a good plan um, and getting ready, you know, in terms of hiring and preparing, you know, safety, um, certainly supportive of the um, wearing masks. And if students don't wear a mask also, you know, what the alternative is in terms of shields. Um, so I appreciate, you know, all the clarity around that and, um, and look forward to, you know, I know students are, are ready to get back to school in January. Thanks, Ms. Munoz. So thanks for that. I just wanted to talk, and we can, I'll, each of you can ask other questions, obviously. Um, but I just want to, again, um, state that, it, you know, it's, it was, would not be legal for us to have figured that out amongst the five of us without this public forum. So, so to the public that's weighed in on this question, thanks for bearing with us so that we could actually have a public discussion and, and talk to the superintendent and her team and convey this. We, I didn't know that this, there would be this consensus because again, in adherence to the Brown Act, we do not have the ability to do that uh, without a public session. So I just wanted to take that time before I proceed with my questions, if that's okay, Superintendent Maldonado. Um, yes, can I, uh, Ms. Yeah. Kapsa, I just want to uh, sure. summarize the decision that you just had, um, I think, uh, to be uh, clear. Our next step sounds like what the board has now approved is that we open Continue with our plans to open January 19th, even if we are in red. Yeah. And okay. we will meet January, January 4th uh, as a special. Uh, I think meeting. it's the 5th, uh, the Tuesday. Sorry, January 5th. 5th. Uh, the January 5th is just a final check in on where yeah. we are with the virus and our final. Regardless, regardless then, of the tier. I believe it's an important special meeting to have, just given the length of time between meetings uh, over the holidays. Great. And then lastly, uh, Ms. Ford, I want to address Ms. Ford's uh, question about uh, decide, parents as, being asked to design, decide next week. I want to remind you of the timeline, and if I could ask Mr. Rouse to just put it up really quick, that we have a built-in verification system for parent decision-making, but we do need some initial decisions so that we can begin our planning of uh, creating schedules for our teachers and our uh, students. Um, for, I'm sorry, for matching teachers to classrooms and uh, making our classroom uh, schedules. Sorry, let me back up. We will have a built-in verification system the weeks, the days of November 12th and 13th, leading up to us then creating the master schedule where we match teachers to parent choices to group A, B, or C. So, I'd like to just get a, that final guidance from the board. Are you asking that we push that back? I'm checking with the team as we speak here and it looks like they do need that time to create the master schedule. So maybe I can buy us one or two more days here, but there is a verification system. So technically our parents have from November 2nd to the 13th for those final decisions. Can I get some guidance from the board on that? Thank you, Mr. Rouse. Yeah, I mean, I also agree with Ms. Ford that we heard from many families um, and some teachers too that the the time frame seemed compressed. Again, I recognize that we're telling you to push, 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 and then we're saying, well, wait, we need more time. So I recognize the uh, the conflict there. Uh, I but again, just given um, the fact that most of these sort of town halls or discussions with about the hybrid model are happening this week, and if not tomorrow, is that is that correct? Most of them are happening tomorrow or Wednesday, they've, Thursday, Friday? They've been, happening, they've been happening, will continue to happen. Yeah, and I've been a part of them as a parent myself, but um, I, I would feel more comfortable if there was 
again, just given the election and the uncertainty of next week, if we could at least add a few more days on the, the following, I don't have my calendar up, but the fall, like roll it over a bit uh, to provide some more time, if that still allows us to get done what we need to do. So I'll ask Ms. Carey and Mr. Rouse to weigh in on that, please. Yeah, sure thing. And Mr. Mr. Rouse, jump in. Uh, effectively, by the time we complete really the two-step process of the family program selection form, we'll have our initial grab of family data from next week. But then we have that subsequent week, the week of the 9th, to um, confirm that data. And if there are mistakes or if people change their mind or if people um, want to clarify or, or, or shift things, they will have that second week to do it. So it's effectively a two-week window although we're really, really wanting that grab of data next week as much as possible, um, because that lets us then stay on track to try to publish student schedules heading into winter break and be well positioned upon our return from winter break to ramp up to the delivery of the hybrid model. I will also just highlight that um, it is usually in December of a normal school year when we begin the master scheduling process for secondary students for the subsequent school year. This year, we're gonna push that back a little bit to accommodate our shift to hybrid because of COVID, but we are also simultaneously planning our normal course request and master scheduling and enrollment timelines for school year 21-22, which might seem hard for folks to believe, but um, the complexity of building secondary master schedules requires that we do that no later um, than, than, than starting that in January, February. So there, there's constraints. Mr. Rouse, is there anything on the back end with technology and could we buy ourselves a little extra time there for the turnaround of schedules to parents? It's always possible to compress some of those timelines. The challenge will really end up falling a lot on our site leaders if we compress the timelines too much. So what we'll be doing as part of this process is running a series of simulations to see how we can match up family choice, um, master schedules, teacher schedules um, and balancing the different groups, especially groups A and B. Um, that will require uh, the eyes of district leaders on those results, the eyes of site leaders on those results. We'll then need to take those and actually process whatever calculations we decide on um, and give, once again, site leaders time to then validate those results, make manual adjustments, and confirm that student schedules are ready for publication. So really there's a lot of steps in there that site leaders and, and um, at the secondary level site counselors will need to do before families can get their schedules. Um, and I think that's really the part that um, made us want to set aside a few weeks for that processing because that's on top of what the uh, sites have to do in terms of just normal uh, school operations during this time. Ms. Molinato, if I could just add that we do anticipate that circumstances may change for individual students and families as they do at any time. You know, we have, may have students moving into our area, um, enrolling with us, changing schools because of changing personal circumstances. So we will always process, um, you know, requests for changes for students who have changing conditions or family conditions that change just as we would in any other year. But we're just trying to grab the data to do a, um, a unique and independent master scheduling process mid-year while staying on track with our with our business as usual. So we need to we need to get a good count of that proactively to do that. Thank you, uh, Ms. Carey, and Mr. Ross. So uh, board members, I, I believe that the, the planning of the weeks, the week of this, uh, sorry, no, I'm looking at my calendar, November 2nd to the 6th, capturing parents' initial requests, having the team have a chance that following week, which has a holiday, as you know, November 11th is Veterans Day, so everybody's off that day, turning around the data that Thursday, November 12th, so that parents can have a chance to verify, change their mind, ask more questions, so that um, by the week of November 16th, we can have the start, the creation of the master schedule. Um, I, I, I need your guidance, board members, if you want us to change that. I know we have a meeting on November 10th, but that may be too late. And uh, just hearing from the teams that will be doing this work, any other questions on that? Ms. Ford has her hand up. Thanks, Superintendent. Oh, thank you. Um, Ms. Carey, I do think it sounded somewhat uh, clear that if a child had, or family had chosen independent uh, study or dis distance learning cohort C that they couldn't change their mind. 
So if you're saying actually there is an opening there for people to change their mind based on personal changes in their family or other issues or needs, I think that's great. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying both things. I'm saying we really need people to fill that form out with what they most clearly are selecting because we have to plan I know. About, about the instructional model, but also about the safety of who will be attending in person. And we have spacing considerations. And so we can't have um, a high degree of fluidity of people moving back and forth be between the program models, or we won't be able to um, adhere to all of those assurances that we that are our guiding principles about health and safety and high quality instruction. But that doesn't mean that there can't be any exceptions. And so it's somewhere between total rigidity and a high level of fluidity. Does that make sense? So we are really advertising and saying that for us to plan appropriately and to adhere to those guidelines that we put forward, we need to see people's um, you know, really best, best selections uh, but that doesn't mean that people's circumstances don't change in unpredictable ways, even in normal times. And of course, we'll always support people with that as we can. Thanks. Are, are you also saying that parents have a choice of which cohort they go into? We're going to be extending the opportunity for people to indicate a preference without guaranteeing that they will, we will be able to honor that preference. Uh, great. I, I, I know it's probably not that popular, but most places are not giving parents a choice. Even we went I, back and forth about that, but we just feel like if we can make it better for folks, that's the point of why we're doing this. We just don't want people to um, become, you know, married to that idea that they will necessarily get get well that we'll be able to honor that preference. I understand. Also, I, I just wanted to say that uh, Susan has something she'd like to add. I think it was in the chat. No. No, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was previous. Thanks, so, uh, Ms. Ford. Dr. Reed. Yes, I just had a question just to clarify then for, you know, like the circumstances that Ms. Carey brought up that a parent felt that they needed to change their mind. They would direct that to their site principal and that would be the process for which they would go through this. Um, we usually do master scheduling with counselors because one principal and 2000 students at a traditional high school is not a workable workflow. So that just as we do with regular course requests and schedule changes, we will have parallel processes. So in secondary, it's counselors in elementary, it's principals. principals. Okay. Just to clarify for both elementary and secondary, what that process is. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I just want to add, you know, in elementary, we generally do not reorganize kids in the middle of the year. You have your teacher in elementary, you have them all year long. And so this is unique, again, in that we, will, we are going to have some kids change teachers just by the nature of parent choices. And so we want to make sure that parents understand that um, there is not a guarantee that, you know, just because I love Dr. Reed, she's my second grade teacher and I want to keep her. Is Dr. Reed going to be an in-person teacher or a distance learning teacher? We're, those are the things we're going to be planning, and there are no guarantees, even though we know we're going to break some hearts there. Yep. Okay, so we're still kind of on this. Thank you. Uh, it, this is good. <laughs> we're still on this question of Superintendent Maldonado trying to seek consensus from the board about um, uh, some sort of leeway in the deadline of of, of parents and families making this decision. Ms. Sims Moten. Yeah, I'm of the mindset that I, I want to respect the timeline that the staff has put before us because they've taken into consideration these questions, understanding that yes, we're in the middle of an election, but they've got to really nail that down in terms of getting us to this January 19th goal and, and making sure that you know parents have as much you know uh, flexibility as you reasonably, reasonably can in this in this tight timeline that we have anyway. And the fact that um, should their adjustments be made have to be made, there is that that ability to do so. But at least you can have some initial planning in this first in this first you know first week. I, I'm of the mindset leaving it like it is, trusting that you you you've really taken into consideration uh, all of the, the you know the comments from the board and from parents with you know parents and or or teachers who may have comment on that on that on that timeline. But I think the more we mess it and move it up the more likely we're going to get into a road that we don't want to get into. And that's just like stretching things out and, and making it a little bit more difficult where we're trying to be more flexible in this. If you need to change it between that first, you know, your first thought, but you have at least to the second, the second week to say, 
maybe something, you know, changed in your family. I really need to do that. So there's that flexibility. So I, I'm comfortable because there is that, that level of flexibility, even in this very tight timeline that we're really trying to make sure you do what you have to do and do what you need to do to get us to January 19th. So I'm of the mindset, leaving it like it is because I, I trust that you guys have thought it through. So, you know. Thank you. Ms. Munoz. Yes, I also agree with Ms. Sims Moulton in terms of the planning that, you know, goes into um, creating the master schedule and the cohorts um, that we keep it to, you know, November 2nd to the 6th. Um, there's been a lot of advance notice about this and the decision. Um, so I also support that is going ahead and, and keeping it to that and considering, you know, the folks that are going to have to do the, all this work in terms of scheduling. Okay, well, there you have it, Superintendent Maldonado. You have uh, some feedback to take what you will with that. Again, these are not motions. These are just uh, consensus and feedback for you. So if, uh, with your permission, I'm going to continue on with my questions um, that obviously are related, but the I will have uh, three questions about hybrid model. Um, I, yes. I wonder if you could just clarify the fact that we did receive a lot of letters from folks that were asking us to actually vote on it, but you might clarify about Brown Act and motion yeah, thank you. voting. Yes. Yeah, we did receive a lot of that. And again, here I'm sort of playing this role of educating uh, a very a very confusing uh, Brown Act, I must admit, um, but now I'm four years into it. We cannot just uh, make a motion out of thin air in a meeting. It would have to have been agendized, meaning it would have had to have been published on Friday uh, before the meeting so that all of you in the public knows what we're actually taking action on. So uh, that, but we can, as we just did, provide feedback and uh, guidance and the, the superintendent and her team can take that and move forward. So uh, again, thank you for that, for that um, reminder. So um, hope that hopefully that clarifies what we've just done here. You have some consensus about three of us believe that we should provide a little more flexibility in that deadline uh, to our supporting, you know, the time frame that you've put forward and you will take what you will from that and move forward. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ford. Um, a couple questions on the hybrid plan. Um, first, this is a, a big kind of higher, higher uh, 30,000 foot question. Why do we need, and this came up with the students when we met last week, why can't we just return to full 100% um, of students in class, in the red tier, in the orange tier, in the yellow tier. Um, just, I just think it's an important thing. I think there is still some confusion that we get some letters saying, Governor, Governor Newsom said it's safe for you to return to, to class. Can you just please address this before I proceed with my questions on hybrid? So the reason we need to do a hybrid model at a very high 30, thousand foot level is that social distancing requires us to have less children in the classroom than we normally would have. Because of that requirement, we would need more classroom space and more teachers to be able to accomplish that. So we want to do that. We, so to, do, to meet the requirement of social distance, we have to split the school in half, bring half at a time so that we can uh, follow those guidance, that guidance. And that is until the white level, is that correct? So it's not even, it's- I will that's, turn to Susan yeah. Klein for that question, yes. Yes, we should expect that students and staff will be wearing face coverings and having physical distance requirements for as long as this uh, pandemic continues. And that's probably gonna be for a long time, quite honestly, until we have a vaccine that's largely distributed. So even if we go down in tiers, we expect physical distance and we expect face coverings to continue. Thank you very much. Okay, um, can you please elaborate on, this is a question we got, I have received multiple times from teachers and, and um, parents and some students, the cohort C, this uh, independent model. I, I learned more tonight with the, with the presentation, uh, the way that it was described, but can you explain the interaction between students who choose to do um, distance learning 
and those cohorts. So I understand that they would be part of the Wednesday. Can you just unpack that a little bit more, either Ms. Carey or Ms. Escobedo uh, for families? Because I think this is such a crucial decision for people to be making who are not quite sure if families that, if they want to keep their child in, in cohort C, which is distance learning, what will the interaction level be with the classroom uh, that is in hybrid, the cohorts that are in hybrid? I'd like to uh, address that question first because I believe the elementary uh, response is a little less right. complicated than the secondary. Uh, so in elementary, the C group will be very, very similar to what they are experiencing right now. They have their own class, they'll have their own teacher, they'll have their own group of students uh, who they will be meeting with on a daily basis uh, in distance learning online. For elementary, there will not be, because they will have an assigned teacher, a certificated SBU teacher, there, there will not be interaction uh, with the hybrid A, B groups. They have their own interactions going daily, just like they have right now in distance learning. So there will not be any interaction if I, if I understood that. Understood. Not with the A, B groups, no, because they okay. have their own class, their own certificated teacher who, who does the multiple subjects um, all day long. They don't need to interact with another, with the other teachers. And can you explain that? Thank you. On the certificated teachers that, um, that I've, cause I've gotten questions about that. Does it, why it has to be a certificated teacher? Can you just speak to the, um, why that is? Yes. Of course, I'm all in favor of it being that. I just want to clarify that because that question has come up a few times. Well, first of all, the, one of the main principles in, and what we are obligated to do is we need to provide uh, quality education uh, by a credentialed qualified teacher for all of our students. Uh, if they are not going to be uh, in person, they need to be assigned to a credentialed teacher who is appropriately matched to their particular grade span. In elementary, it's a multiple subject uh, teacher. But yes, it has to be, they need to have an assigned credential, teach qualified credential teacher. That, that is, that's not our rule, that is, that is a, ma a state mandate. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Uh, so Ms. Carey, do you wanna elaborate that? Just again, well, again, I know you walked us through it with uh, the presentation, but again, I do, I do believe that this is such a threshold question for families. What will it be like if they choose to stay distance? And I think the original perception was that they'll sort of be out in the wilderness on their own, but can you, can you please unpack that and describe that a bit more? Absolutely, it is different in secondary than it is in elementary. Yeah. Um, and we made based on based on a lot of feedback from from our original um, proposals, we made the decision to not separate out the Group C students. Um, not that that was that decision is also informed by the complexity of credentialing of teachers in the secondary space, which is again different from an elementary where a, a teacher's credential is a is a multi subject credential, a multi grade credential, effectively. So that means that in secondary. Group C students or students who are doing 100% distance learning are effectively embedded within the hybrid model. Mm -hmm. And so what I'll reiterate is that um, rather than saying a day in the life of a group C student, I'll say a week in the life of a group C student. Um, what would happen for me if I'm participating in learning 100% of the time in a, in a distance format is that every Wednesday we'll start there because that's the most common ground. I'll be with my um, group A and group B peers with our teacher over Zoom. That will just be true. There'll be no difference between me and, and anyone else on, on those Wednesdays. Um, then two days a week, I'll be essentially doing whatever it is that the, the in-person students are doing who are having their at-home days, their two at-home days. So if, um, if there's a group of students, let's say group B is in person on Tuesday and Friday, Group B will be at home on Monday and Thursday. So I'll be doing something very similar on Monday and Thursday to what Group B is doing. The other two days, I won't be able to fully simulate the in-person experience that, that Group A is having. Um, so there'll be some, I need to have the same access to the same standards. Um, and so I'll be doing something comparable that lets me have that same access to curriculum. 
Um, and that's where there'll need to be some modifications and accommodations for group C students. Some of our teachers already design and deliver curriculum. Um, in fact, the, the more flipped a classroom teacher's uh, model of instruction is, the, the more seamless these experiences of group A, B, and C students. Um, and I think some teachers will be migrating their practice that way. Does that help with the group C experience? I believe it does. Yeah, thank you. I mean, again, just to reiterate, I understand the anxiety about around this big decision. And so the more we communicate, over communicate, uh, the better. But thank you for that. Uh, my other second, my last question on hybrid is um, there's been some teachers who have put forward uh, a proposal about kind of teaching live and some other families. I've also gotten, we've gotten some emails from uh, to the board about um, the ability for teachers to be uh, simultaneously, which I know is a huge uh, charge to be teaching on those remote students, but also in class. And if you could speak to that, I know that in the current hybrid plan that you all have developed, um, there's the ability for the teacher to do that in the morning, but it's a basically a 30 minute uh, time frame in which a teacher would be both speaking to those students in front of him or her, plus those who are remote. And I understand too, I've heard from some teachers how challenging that is to do that and I get it. Um, um, but can you speak to that, that plan and why, and what your thoughts are about, um, the ability for teachers to, to, if they choose to, to do more of that so that the, the students who are at home, um, can stay with the class that's, that's, um, that's live as much as possible. Here again, it's a bit different for elementary than secondary. I'll go first this time and then kick it to Ms. Escobedo for her clarification of that piece. Uh, in secondary, what we are stipulating is that at least 20 minutes of every class period every day will be time when connected through Zoom, the at-home students and the group C students will be experiencing the same instruction from that live teacher as the students who are in person in the classroom with the teacher. Now, um, in secondary, we don't prescribe what part of the period that is. In fact, it will depend on the lesson that day. Um, because there were, as we saw on the day of the life slides, there might be activities that better lend themselves to whole class experiences that come toward the end of the period or the learning progression versus the beginning. Or it might make sense that day or, or most days even to have a check in more toward the beginning of the class period. But there will be at least those 20 minutes out of 80 where group A, B, and C students will all be together supported by video conferencing, you know, Zoom. Um, and what is also true in secondary and different from elementary is that teachers may do well beyond those 20 minutes. For example, if we want to have a, a Socratic seminar or some other kind of, of, of interactive experience that is collaborative or collective, we may be the whole period um, connected, you know, the face-to-face -face group with the group that is at home. There are limitations, however, and, and this is important, and we're still kind of looking through that um, or working through our, our options. Um, so students can be Zooming from home effectively in an unlimited fashion. We've seen that in distance learning, but there are some limitations to how many users can be on a campus and uploading video through Zoom simultaneously. So it turns out that hundreds of people can be doing that simultaneously, but at a high school, hundreds is not everyone, even as we cohort our groups and divide the student body in half. So we have to just think through um, the capacity of students who are in person on campuses um, to be able to, to access their at-home peers through Zoom. Okay. Um, I hope that helps for secondary, okay. and it is help here, helpful here to parse out elementary and secondary for these questions. So Ms. Escobedo? Yeah, so for elementary, very similar uh, to secondary. Uh, in the AB groups, uh, because half of the students will be at home, the check-in for elementary for many reasons, uh, including attendance, including the fact that we know that the little ones need a, a little more structured reminders uh, at the beginning of the day to really get them motivated, get them started, because we really wanna hone in and take that social emotional temperature, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, the choice that was made for hybrid uh, check-ins, daily check-ins is in the morning, first thing in the morning, uh, starting off all together at 8.30. Now, um, just like uh, in secondary, if the teacher decides 
later in the day that they want to do small groups just like we would in, 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 in any normal circumstances. Um, and they want to pool, have their students that are present working in small groups while they pool a small group online, they absolutely have the choice to do that. Uh, but the, the structured daily check-in um, for all the reasons mentioned uh, is set for the morning. Okay, thank you so much for clarifying that. Dr. Reed, did you have a question on this on this point? Yes, I, did. Uh, I just wanted to follow up with, what is the opportunity if there is an elementary teacher that wants to pilot this opportunity, let's say in um, doing what, what was brought up here, really combining hybrid with um, remote on, an, on, an, on, on, a, on a larger scale. So in other words, not just the check-in period. And I'm just curious if there's professional development for this. I mean, is there an opportunity for teachers to choose this as a model, even though this has been situated by in this more structured format? Dr. Reed, I think if we were to, uh, and Mrs. Gavilla, you can jump in after me. Um, if we were to do something like that, we would have to announce that we have a pilot program that's a little different so that parents may want to opt into that. Uh, that would take us an additional time for planning. So I'd like to have us um, think through about that and maybe get back to you the next time we meet on that question. Thank you for clarifying that. Thanks, Dr. Reed, for that question. I just, I do want to say that I, I'm not, as much as I want, I'm glad to hear that there's this flexibility. I also understand that there, there's pressure on teachers, <laughs> so much pressure to learn so many new ways in which we're this this environment. I mean, just just right now, I'm you know do, engaged in this meeting, and my son just came in to say goodnight, and I got flummoxed. So I understand. I, I, I as much as I, I am happy to hear that there is flexibility for those teachers who really gravitate towards being able to do both at the same time, I, I'm, I have a lot of respect for the challenges that that presents to teachers. So thank you for that. Um, okay, my last question, and maybe some of uh, the board members have questions on this, is just related to hiring. And so Dr. Becchio, um, I think we were all a bit um, concerned two weeks ago when we met that you know hiring was such a challenge. Uh, you presented a bit of a more positive picture tonight, but can you really um, unpack again what you had indicated about the aggressive? I think that was your word. Um, practices that you're that you are uh, engaging in because I I can speak for myself. We don't want to get to January nineteenth or January fifth and have the fact that we don't have positions filled be a reason or rationale for any type of delay. So, um, and again, we have some community members on the line here who might be engaged in helping us get the high quality staff that we need in order to pull this hybrid model off. Yeah, well, thank you for that question. Um, so yeah, we've just um, posted this, these positions in places that we typically don't. We're usually able to be, be fully staffed um, by using adjoin and our local job boards at the school sites and you know um, principals that know people um, in this case we we um, took out ads we um, in in particular the one in the independent that has our job flyer there um, and some of our uh, social media and actually craigslist and we're um, we're, um, we don't know the outcome yet of where we're getting applicants from, so we'll we'll take a look at that for future reference as well. But um, the um, college job boards as well, uh, those are places that we thought might be a good potential since it's three to five hours we're asking for, uh, could work into student schedules. Um, but also, uh, I think particularly in the playground supervisor realm, um, I, I believe that uh, the um, principals and uh, and referring their school community members to maybe taking on three or four hours is um, going to also be a promising uh, possibility in this, particularly in the playground supervisor range or realm. So uh, those are the kind of things we're doing. Um, I will say that, you know, I looked into the system, just wanted to get current data for you too. That's not on the slides, but, um, for playground supervisors, we have 25 applicants in the pipeline to apply. I can see who's who's gone in and started an application, but um, you know we only have the um, the few that have actually submitted it. Uh, we have 15 paras that are in process of applying, 
and then we have eight floater custodians that are in process. So um, that's a little a little bit more good news. It's just that they they sometimes don't complete the applications in there either. So that's a reality of the situation. The last thing I'll say is um, just for more information is that I, I want you to keep in mind though that um, we still have to be very judicious about who we're going to hire and put in front of our kids. And so we, um, sure. I, I know you know that, um, you support that, but I do want to mention that because it's not as aggressive as we want to be, um, we still have to be very judicious about who we're choosing to put in front of our kids. And I just wanted to make sure that point was clear, but as we have, you know, 200 people online right now, we have a bunch of principals, our labor unions, we've given them the flyers. Uh, just um, know that if you have quality people that want to serve in a part-time uh, temporary position to have them um, apply for these jobs. Hope that answered your question. Yeah, absolutely. I would just add again, I just to reiterate, I just don't want a hiring, um, the hiring to slow us down in any regard. So if it takes a recruitment firm or reassigning, I'm this, that's your job, but I am supportive of more resources, whatever it might take. Um, because we just, this is such a priority. And so I'd, I'd ask too, uh, if we could have a weekly update about how hiring is going leading into January, I think that'd be very helpful for the board. Um, kind of, we're kind of tackling the subject by subject. Did any bar board members want to ask about hiring just while we're here? Dr. Reed? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I totally agree. I think one, one thought I had was with paraeducators, usually the principals have a really good sense of who could be potential paraeducators. So I'm just thinking, how are we strategic as a backup plan for principals to be looking at their, their um, potential and their paraeducators? And also in terms of playground attendees, um, you're, is this something that we could have um, training already? There should be some sort of training or plan that if we don't have that staff, that there is a training that's in place that parents could go through or volunteers who would need to be obviously fingerprinted, um, but also to have some sort of strategic backup just so that we have people on the bench. I agree with Ms. Caps. We don't wanna be not moving forward on January 19th because we don't have this taken care of. So I'm just trying to think outside of the box if it's not uh, seeking elsewhere, but how can we utilize our admin staff perhaps or um, parents who would like to volunteer and engage um, and how, what type of training would they need and what would that processes or protocol need to be in place to ensure that we're getting, you know, obviously the right people in the classroom or outside in the yard, right? During, um, during lunchtime and such. Yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Reed. Um, I, I will just mention, I mentioned briefly earlier about a, um, a plan um, to make sure that our schools are staffed, even if we don't fill all the positions and, and meet those goals. Um, I, I was not ready with that plan to present it to you, but um, it just needs a little bit more work. But it does, um, there, I do have a tiered alternative plan that I'll bring some of these ideas you're mentioning will you will see that emerge in our plan so that each site um, has uh, has a playbook so to speak of when they're short because remember um, even if we have the positions filled we may have staff members on any given day at any given school that are out because of symptoms and so we need to be able to mobilize uh, even if we hire all these positions, we need to be able to mobilize management positions here at the district to be able to go to school sites and help school sites. So um, I'm working on a comprehensive plan to make sure that every site knows what steps to take uh, depending on their situation on any given day. So I'll be able to present that to you. I just don't have it done now. No, but I thank you because I think doing it now is the most opportune time so that we can work out the kinks as we move forward. And I appreciate that you are in the process of working on that because we, we will need people on the bench. Thanks. Okay, on the hiring subject, uh, uh, Ms. Ford. Um, thanks. Uh, Dr. Becchio, our, um, our, is, it, is it looking like, uh, let's say a regular elementary school has 500 students. Let's say 100 students request 
cohort C, then a number of the, how many teachers would be reassigned to this alternative assignment uh, to work with just the cohort C group, if it's 100? Well, that's probably going to be three or four teachers. And so the additional teachers that are needed, uh, where, where are you say, seeing that they would go? Because it seems like at least in an elementary school, the schools are all staffed for the number of students they have. It's just that some teachers will have different assignments, right? That's correct. So where will we need teachers? Well, we're, we're needing right now, you saw the graphic, we're needing um, substitute teachers. For sure. No other yeah. teachers though? Right, but the hybrid model, and this is one of the big considerations of answering the students' questions um, that came to you as board members, and that is, why can't we just go back full in person? And to oh, I know that, all that. <laughs> yeah, so to do that, we would need to hire more uh, significantly more teachers. When you go into the hybrid, when you go into the hybrid model, though, um, we can use our existing staff uh, to um, actually facilitate that hybrid model. So we're not, we don't really have a need for more teachers. If now again, remember, some teachers may not be able to return to in person in the secondary, and we may need to. Um, we have to have a plan for that. Either it's a backfill with a substitute teacher or that teacher actually um, would, would teach their class remotely if they're on quarantine and, and have to get through 14 days. So um, the, the, the bigger need is right now in the area of substitute teachers. Great. Um, I wanted to know, and maybe it's not your question, but it is about teachers. Um, what's the decision about outdoor classrooms? Uh, we bought a lot of tents, the tents are going up. Do teachers have the option to either teach in their room or outside, or what, what are we thinking about that? I think some people are interested in knowing about the environment. Yeah, I would, um, I'd actually ask if um, our ed services team could field that question, because I'm not sure about the planning with site administrators on how those are going to be implemented. I know that there's several um, per site that have been acquired, and so maybe should, um, Ms. Carey or Anna could take that. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we have more conversation about teaching outside than we do about have te teaching outside under a tent. <laughs> so there's a lot of spaces on, on, well, our campuses are very different, as you know, but there is a lot of outdoor space on most of our campuses. Um, but it is not necessarily going to be space that that is covered with a tent. There's a logistics associated with the tents. And frankly, the number of tents we have in a secondary context um, are, are not enough to say, give every teacher the option of teaching that room that, that day in their room or that day in, in the tent. Um, there's set up and take down. And then there's also technology to consider. So tents are not so much the solution for secondary particular, I would say, but that doesn't mean that outdoor learning in the outdoor setting is not something that I think we're going to see commonly. That's a big part of a lot of conversations. And there are a lot of sp spaces in secondary that lend themselves to that courtyards and amphitheaters and those kinds of spaces. It's true. We have a lot of areas with trees too and great seating spaces. Uh, I think that's it for me. All right, we're kind of doing this uh, topic by topic a bit. So we're sort of on hiring and now also outdoor. Wendy seems from. Hi, thank you. I'm, I'm just going to go uh, thinking outside the box on the hiring pieces. Um, you know, as through COVID, a lot of um, early care providers or child care providers weren't able to really reopen their their uh, businesses. And so we might reach out to the early care. They might be able to support us with play, playground, and even perhaps even paraprofessionals not knowing what they had prior to opening up a child care center. So that might be an option also to look at in terms of folks. They've been fingerprinted, all those things that are already taken in place that you have to do that might help us as well. Uh, thank you for that. Good point. Okay. Um, well, th that uh, those are my questions. So I will, uh, uh, as we've been doing here, it's a fluid conversation. Um, Dr. Reed, I'll give the floor to you. Great. I just have a few questions. And um, I think uh, the way this has gone is really nice to have it by topic. Um, so 
A, a couple of questions. In terms of remote learning only, is there an opportunity for students to connect with their teacher in small cohorts or in to be one-on-one? -on -one? Um, and I'm thinking more in elementary right now. I'm thinking because that connection um, is not is not there that the hybrid model will have, but is there a possibility for that? How that might look? Uh, I would, yes, thank you, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yes, for elementary, again, um, the teachers, we have a schedule, right? And we have a recommended um, a set of, of blocks, if you will, uh, for both the in-person and the at-home learning. Uh, but uh, the teacher, the classroom teacher is still responsible for both groups and they will be seeing them on alternate, alternate days. Uh, but like I stated earlier, not only will they be checking in whole group, uh, but they will be checking in with them as they feel uh, as needed um, at throughout the day, whether they are in person or in small groups in person or one on one in person like we do as conferences, um, or when they are uh, on the online um, online learning day as well. Um, also remembering that um, part of uh, the, it's not just going to be online um, learning, some of it is also going to be, you know, your, your, your traditional, very familiar um, activities that uh, will be maybe assignments where as a teacher, I know the, a lot of those assignments were geared to be able to check in and be able to kind of make my notes. Okay, let me see how they're doing. Um, and so those are traditional practices that, that will continue so that the teachers can kind of gauge, okay, who do I need to check on? Who do I need to follow up with um, as they are submitting and, and, um, and working through on the days that they're there and they're not there. So those opportunities will continue to be there for teachers just like they are uh, on a regular schedule. Great, so the teacher would obviously connect with the principal to outline whatever plan that they might have if they were gonna be meeting with their remote student, if there was a need for meeting with the remote student, correct? Uh, so you, um, the principals and the teachers are working out on, on those plans. The daily schedules and the daily meetings um, are usually left up to the teachers because again, um, you, you have uh, 30, 25 to 30 teachers, um, unless there is a problem, of course, or there's a concern where uh, the teacher needs to talk to the principal about, um, or maybe another resource at the school, like a school psych uh, or you know, other resources, um, then I would, I would uh, say that they would have that communication. But teachers usually have their, their own plan and their own one-on-one -on -one meetings um, online or in small groups as, as needed. Thank you. And then just with, the, with regards to the hybrid, how are teachers or how can they be or have they been included to help create this hybrid plan that we're currently looking at? So that's a great question. And uh, back to it takes a village, right? Uh, so a, a lot of uh, the input we had, obviously, um, big picture, big planning, uh, and then we filtered it down. The uh, advisory task teams um, have been exactly for that. And, and that that's the formal structure where all stakeholders uh, had an opportunity to see um, the big picture plan and then modify it and, and personalize it to their very school specific needs. Uh, but then along with that formal structure, uh, there, are, there have been so many um, um, informal conversations and opportunities that principals have on an ongoing basis, like coffee with the principal, uh, like just the emails that, that we're receiving in those conversations where people uh, have had the opportunity to give those feedback. And we have then received that feedback, just, just like you all. Um, and all of that was taken into consideration to finalize. Um, this is why it, it, it took a while. It was not something that we could, it's not a cookie cutter uh, model. It's very personalized uh, for Santa Barbara and for the needs and, and based on the input of our stakeholders. Great, so in going forward, that would also be, that flexibility is still there in terms of teachers wanting to, you know, not sort of be within this particular box. I mean, there's a structure box, but there's a flexibility there and they would work with their principal on that.
We call them guardrails. Okay, guardrails. <laughs> thank you. Um, so in fact, I, well, I wanted to just call out uh, Ms. Barnwell and say thank you for putting together this fact um, document. I think it was really, really excellent and that communication with all of our community. And I really appreciate the a lot of work that went into and the fact that you're you're already, I'm sure, taking in public comments and these comments and already making changes in, in this what we call fluid document. Um, in that fact 11, that elementary students will have more total instructional time with the hybrid model, including daily check-ins with teachers and classmates. Um, what is being done to compensate for this for remote learning? And maybe that goes back to um, Ms. Escambillo. So um, back to the math, right? It is, it's all about math and um, in doing the math and going through this, this planning and making sure that we give every one of our groups the, the, the best possible quality program based on their selection, uh, we did the math. And, and when you add up the math um, in the hybrid model, total instructional time because we are following on the two days that they are there in person it's a longer day it's a it's it's close to a regular school day which is longer than the california required uh minimum instructional minutes per grade level and so um it, it, it is, it just happens to be that way um, because of the two days in person. As far as the, the group C students, um, because um, they are in distance learning and because of the concern uh, of, you know, they can't be online on, on camera for too long a period of time, they will continue to, to follow the distance learning um, model which includes their, the, minimal, the minimum required minutes, but they will be doing that in a consistent way with, a, 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 like we said, a credential teacher. Uh, and it's a, a familiar way that they have been able to do um, up until now since August. And, and it will be able to ensure uh, their concerns, their health concerns as to why they will not be able uh, to be in person. Along with that remi re reminder that if, if they do feel like uh, they can come and participate in any after school program uh, that is available at their school site or enrichment or uh, whatever the case may be, they will have the opportunity to, to do that. Okay, thank you. And then and fact number 13, just to reiterate that students can go to hybrid, but there has to be space availability for them to go into hybrid if they choose to go into hybrid at a later time. Is there or do we need a policy as to how those are chosen to return? How are they? Let's say there's a large group that decides all at once they want to go into hybrid. How will that what's the protocol for that? How will they be chosen or, you know, is there a policy that we need? Uh, so in traditional, typical, normal times or before COVID times, um, it is all based and will continue to be based on availability, right? Uh, when, when you have a class that is at capacity or grade level that it's at cap capacity, um, um, then maybe you have a wait list. Um, but I, I think at this point uh, it will, have to be based on a case by case uh, situation um, based on if we had maybe some students that started off in hybrid um, and then for whatever reason their situation changed and they had to go into into the distance learning and now that frees up a couple of spaces in that particular class uh, that meets the needs of that particular student uh, then again uh, that this is why it's going to be uh, a, a a decision that has to be looked at very carefully by uh, the site administrator and based on the availability at the school site at that grade level at that time. Okay, so we really don't know that you couldn't, get, there's just no guarantee necessarily. No guarantee. Okay. There is um, no okay, thank you. And then just one, one other thing. Um, so I got an email regarding the fact that there, um, in order, there's been sort of a trend of um, the growing needs of students who, if they get sick, they need access to doctor's notes. And this has led to decreased participation in the cohorts or decreased in-person enrollment and attendance. Can you address that? If, you know, 
if students aren't able to have access to doctors to get notes and they have symptoms and they aren't being tested, then this could actually lead to no healthcare, no note, misclassed and lowered attendance. So it's an equity issue on top of the fact that it could lead to perhaps um, many students um, and a breakout. Well, I, think, I think, yeah, I'd, I'd like to address this and then, um, or actually Susan, why don't you talk about the from the public health perspective and then I'll follow up. That sounds great. I think that is directly related to what we do. So if someone has a symptoms that are consistent with COVID, but we don't know if it's COVID, we send them to their healthcare provider. That healthcare provider may know, oh, this person has a history of allergies, let's say. So we know that their sneezing and coughing is related to their allergies. They can write a note and then it doesn't interfere. Or they can say this, this child or this individual needs testing. There's no reason why anyone in our community should be able to get healthcare because we have community health centers and all community health centers are required to provide service for anyone, whether they're documented, whether they have insurance, there's always options on sliding fee scale for people anywhere in our community. And they're good options. We have good health care options through neighborhood clinics, through public health care centers. Those are good places to go. And, and families with children need that because they need to get their children vaccinated to go to school. So we want children to be assessed by the people who know them best, their own health care providers. And we are taking a cautious approach. Anyone, adult or child, who has a symptom that may be consistent with COVID, we want them to be out until either they have been tested, they've been seen by their doctor, we know it's safe. Our job is to make sure that we stop transmission and we keep both children and adults safe. So we don't want them to be in school until we've made those decisions and we know that that's clear. So the lack of healthcare should not be an issue. We have healthcare centers and that's their role and function. And I've had an opportunity to speak to many of the school nurses in Santa Barbara Unified in the last couple of weeks, even without school students in class, because they're hearing from families, they're hearing about their students and they're taking appropriate action. And I, I feel very good about your system and the follow-up your nurses are doing in supporting families and helping them get the care they need. Thank you, Susan. And I'd follow up with you, um, we have absolutely guaranteed that schools will be safe when students return. And, and we actually have 700 students there in small cohorts. And so we have to guarantee their safety. And the only way that families are going to feel safe returning is if we are able to say that if COVID is suspected, we are acting and we're acting swiftly um, it may seem draconian to say um, you have to have a note before you come back, but that's not really the way we operate. We say you'll need to um, provide a doctor's note or quarantine for 14 days, whatever the, the matter is, and, and the cases are different and the guidelines are different. But we also say, you know, do you have your own um, health care provider? Would you... Uh, we have a list. In fact, Family Service Agency just developed a really nice updated list that we're going to be handing out. So we also have the promotoras who are working with us and our own family engagement unit. So um, this is all done with a lot of care and compassion um, so that we can guarantee that we'll be safe. Great, thank you. Maybe that could be translated in Spanish and be part of the fact list. Um, it's already translated in Spanish. Family Service Agency translates everything that they create. Okay, I mean, but could it be part of the, the fact, just an additional fact to just define it more clearly? We can add it to the FAQ, Ms. Yes. Ms. Dr. Wagner. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Dr. Reed, thank you. Uh, other questions from the board, other comments? Ms. Moten. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, as we're, we're hiring folks who are trying to really, you know, um, be very aggressive on that part, where's the testing of those folks coming in in that process? Have we thought about that? Because there's another piece that, you know, that's gotta get there before they get on our campuses. 
Are you talking about COVID-19 testing, Ms. Susan? Yes, uh, I know the other tests have to come, but I, with yeah. COVID at this point, yeah. So we did change our testing timeline to the week of January 4th to the 15th. Uh, and I, I'm gonna step in here, Dr. Beck, you can clarify if I say this wrong, but we are going to move the timeline so that we are testing everybody again uh, for the second round. And I think we're doing uh, at-home kits this time around so that everybody's tested during those two weeks. And so whoever's hired by then will also be tested. Okay, great, thank you. Good, other questions? Ms. Ford, or comments? Uh, thanks. I, I, I'm not sure that um, it was clear to me. So Dr. Becchio, are we open to volunteers on campus? Yes. And so what's the process to, uh, to do that? Is that a site decision? Um, yes, they will be most of the time what happens is the sites will have their host of volunteers that they're recruiting to um, be a part of their program. And so that typically is done at the site level. They do, um, depending on the type of volunteer, they do go through uh, a volunteer HR process, uh, depending on what kind of volunteer they are. Okay, great. I think that we may need to rely on volunteers and we have a lot of parents, I think, who are really interested in doing that and maybe even community members or board members, who knows. Um, I, I don't think I have any other specific questions. I, I just want to reiterate, honestly, that we received so many eloquent and thoughtful letters and as well as the comments that were made tonight. Um, and they included really reasonable questions that we have to be able to answer. And I found myself as I was reading them, so I hope it's natural for everyone to, to feel somewhat uncomfortable or uninformed or unsure, but um, I, I think that we're on a really strong path. And so I wanna just thank the parents who reached out to us and the students um, and teachers who have just said, but what about, but what about, but what about, this is really important and makes us better every day um, but I have just seen a tremendous response on the part of school staff, school leaders, and the cabinet and uh, Ms. Maldonado just to try to get this right. And uh, so tonight I end with gratitude. Thank you. That's good. And I'll just reiterate too, um, you know, a common theme of the letters was, you know, so many teachers who don't understand the plan or feel unsupported or have questions or didn't feel like they were part of the task force that came up with the hybrid plan, um, of course. Um, and so many you know, parents and students themselves not understanding the plan. We have a, a clear goal now. And I just hope, and I know you all share this hope and you're working hard towards it, but communication is incredibly valuable, but I would, you know, in a perfect world, we would get to January 19th and there wouldn't be those, uh, that, that type of communication towards the board or to anyone of, hey, I don't know what's going on. I'm left out of the loop. I don't get it. So we just, that takes so much work. I, I, I know that I just want to uh, um, sympathize with that feeling of this uncertain time and also support the staff and whatever it takes. I mean, um, if it, whatever is needed in addition supports to you all in order to do that, that's what I'm for because this is, could not be more important to get to opening so that everyone is clear about what we're doing, why we're doing it, how they're supported and what the instructional model will be. Thanks for this great discussion. We did this uh, in about two hours and 40 minutes because it's that important. And thanks to the public, I'll uh, allow Ms. Maldonado to have the final word here if she would like yes. to. Thank you so much. Thank you board members for again, supporting us, providing guidance and thoughtful questions and to everyone else who's uh, deeply uh, in conversation with us. I just wanna wrap up by um, uh, some of the things we're taking away. We will be opening January 19th, uh, red or better. Let's go for the gold, everybody. I still wanna have everybody support us. Let's do this. I know we can do it. 
uh, use our masked and mighty uh, campaign so that we can get everybody out there safely. Um, we will uh, continue to ask our parents to give choices between the dates of November 2nd to the 6th with an opportunity to confirm their choices the days of uh, the following week, which is Thursday and Friday, the 12th and 13th, so that they can have time to confirm, change their mind, ask questions, and it's almost, it almost becomes a two-week period. And I just want to say to everybody, as much as all of us have our heart dedicated to our children, I do want to be clear, we cannot guarantee anything. And so please all work together to help us to get our county safe for our children to be back in schools and do our best to get everybody back on track. Thank you, board members. Thank you. Okay, this agenda item has uh, is a wrap. Uh, let's take a quick break. Actually, let's make it until uh, 9.50. So that's about... Um, uh, nine minutes and congratulations to the Dodgers. Uh, while we've been working here, they just won the World Series. So, um, okay, well, we'll be back at nine, <laughs> 9.50. Excellent. Okay, thanks everybody. We're back. Uh, we got a few items to take care of here. Um, starting with just a, a explanation, uh, there is no further public comment on non-agenda matters. The one speaker we had is uh, probably off doing something different in her life. Um, so we will move to item E, which is the consent agenda. Do any board members wish to poll or ask questions about any consent items in, in uh, the consent agenda? Seeing none, I believe, um, I need a motion. Move to approve the uh, consent agenda. Thanks, Ms. Ford. Dr. Reed, I saw your hand up. How about a second? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye, motion carries. Great. That moves us on to, excuse me here, um, ac our action agenda, which is item F1. Um, that is Mr. Visolini, who I see has joined us here in the panelists, uh, with a nice pink tie. How about F1, approval of resolution 2020-21, uh, approving guaranteed maximum price authorization, authorizing the contractor to proceed with construction and adopting the plans and specifications for the McKinley Elementary School main building alteration and elevator tower project. I read the whole members, <laughs> Meeting board members and Superintendent Maldonado. Um, very happy to bring this project to the board finally. Um, it's, it's proven particularly difficult to get this project through the Division of State Architect which has resulted in the timeline for the project slipping about six months. Um, most of the delays were due to structural requirements from DSA to put an elevator in that very old building of ours. Um, but we're happy that it's gotten through now. So um, as a reminder about the project, um, it's, going to up, it's going to transform an unused space upstairs that's nearly 2,200 feet, square feet in size um, that's been closed to the school's use for like 15 years because of ADA accessibility issues. Um, so it's going to be converted into a maker space. It will get all new LED lighting. It will get um, updated technology and it will get new audio visual um, equipment. It's also going to get two brand new restrooms that are gender neutral and are ADA compliant. Um, you probably noticed that this, this agenda is a little different um, in that there were two items for the same project on one agenda. Um, the first was the consent that we just saw that was for the contract documents and for the facilities and site leases um, for the project. And typically I bring those to you um, before the guaranteed maximum price. Um, but in, in this case, um, given the delays by DSA and the fact that our contractor has been working in the background and was able to provide us with a guaranteed maximum price very quickly after we got approved plans and specifications, um, we decided to try and take advantage of the remaining window that COVID has provided and get under construction as soon as we can. Um, I did check with general counsel to ensure that we're on solid ground, having both of these items on one agenda. And I wanted to point out that this will not be a regular occurrence. Um, so um, with that, um, we're asking the board to approve the resolution to move forward with construction and to approve the guaranteed maximum price with McGillivray construction. Um, which is under budget. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to answer any questions you might have and have the board take action. 
Thank you. Under budget, Ms. Simmons Bowden. Well, I like that. I would make the motion on that alone. But I do, have, I do have a question. Um, so, when can you explain a little bit what you mean by uh, what you're saying by maker space? What does that mean? Uh, maker space is kind of a community space. So this one's um, really kind of cool because it's 2,200 square feet, but there's going to be a large room and there's going to be a small room, and they will be divided by what's called a skyfold door, which is a which is a, a glass door that folds up into the ceiling. So they'll still have a small door to use during regular times if they want to stay separated, but it gives them the opportunity to use it in two spaces or open it up into use one. And they're using a lot of things like, you know, 3D printers and then and increased technology and video options. It's just kind of a place that's outside your normal classroom that gives people a, a, a place to play for no other, for no lack of a better term. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I'd love to make a motion to move this forward. Ms. Kepps. Excellent. Do I need a second? Any other questions? I see Dr. Reed with a second. All in, I, I'm sorry, I, that was a confusing question. <laughs> uh, let me separate that. Do I have any questions before we move forward with the second? No, okay, that was, those are hands up for the second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Vizzolini. Thank you, board. Thank you. Uh, item F2, which is uh, Ms. Carey and Ms. Larios Horton, approval of secondary newcomer emergent multilingual expository reading and writing. I think that's F3, maybe one before it. F2 is the charter school. Oh, okay. On my agenda, I printed out maybe from earlier. Great. Um, I have it as F2 is that's interesting uh, on my agenda, uh, but sure, let's do, uh, let's do, huh, I wonder if this is. Sandra, can you confirm for us um, F2, is the Peabody Charter School another to the actuals? That is correct. F2 is uh, Peabody Charter School. That we have. Okay, let's do that one. My apologies, I printed out an agenda, perhaps it's been updated since. F2, uh, Peabody Charter. Thank you. I'll, I guess I'll take this. Um, thank you, board members. As a fiscal agent of the charter schools, it is our responsibility to review all financial reports. This one on the agenda tonight is Peabody's Unaudited Actuals, which is approved by their board on September 10th. I have reviewed the unaudited actuals, and Peabody is an, um, is, has a healthy reserve of 21%. However, they do pull over $300,000 from their fundraising up um, to put into their operating account to remain uh, solvent. However, their fundraising count, account has approximately $389,000 additionally. I've um, written in my letter to them that they should be cautious regarding their um, fundraising account due to the lack of fundraising that would probably happen this year and possibly next. They're aware of it. We have conversations about it. We have emailed back and forth about it. Um, and they're very much aware and they are um, planning to um, take that into consideration. Um, their charter or their cafeteria fund is also on uh, deficit spending like many um, cafeteria funds are doing during COVID. Um, we just don't sell as many meals, so that does prove to be problematic. Um, but overall, I believe they are in good financial shape. And um, so there's, can approve this. We usually put these on consent. Um, in the future, I will make sure that the letter that I review and write to them um, is with the reports come first interim so that we can, if, if you agree to put these on consent, because it's just really a, um, we don't really have any approval rights to approve their um, charter. It's um, financials, but it is a good thing for you to know where the charters stand. And so from here on out, I will include my letter on any of the reports. And if it's okay with all of you, um, we'll put these in consent. 
So with that, I'm off, um, asking for you to approve the uh, Peabody 2019-2020 unaudited actuals. I just have a question. Sure. And Ms. Simpson. So uh, on the fundraising and the fact that they needed to use some of the fundraising to cover their operating expense, were there any restrictions on that fundraising to be able to do that? Or they just, they can use it however? They can use it for it for whatever. Okay. So, and why not their reserve? Due to the fact that fundraising is low in COVID. Well, actually, if they put the, if they reported it on their audited actuals as their balance as of 630, that could actually fall to fund balance but they always send they some some this like Adelante does do that but Santa Barbara Charter and, and Peabody don't so I always required that they prove to me what the ending fund balance was at every reporting period okay Ms. Ford. Ms. Ford oh I was going to move to approve Peabody's oh, oh good I think you're entitled to move to approve that one uh second second Ms. Swinton thank you all in favor aye. aye aye thank you thank you Mr. Tate motion carries I'm going back to my digital copy which is uh uh more complete okay item f3 now again back to you Ms. Carey and Ms. Larios Horton with pleasure. Uh, you have heard already from Ms. Larios Horton on this, so I will turn it over to her straight away. Thank you, Ms. Carey. Good evening, board members. At our last board meeting, I shared with you information about a small but very important curriculum pilot now before you for adoption. Next slide, Brian. The um, Expository Reading and Writing Curriculum 3.0, as you recall, is an English language arts with aligned designated and integrated ELD, English language development, which will present our newcomer emergent multilingual learners with a more rigorous and relevant curriculum. Next slide, please. Our adoption timeline was also shared with you and we are now at the end of this timeline. And so uh, before I ask you uh, to um, for questions, I would like to recognize the educators who have been working so very hard on this pilot implementation. Um, and I would like to name them. Um, at Dos Pueblos, uh, Ms. Robin Selzler. At San Marcos High School, Ms. Susan Kipp and Ms. Yoli Gavaldon. At La Colina Junior High School, Ms. Maureen Granger. At La Cumbre, Ms. Kathy Borden. Um, at Santa Barbara Junior High School, Ms. PJ Carmian. And at Santa Barbara High School, Ms. Leonette Santana and Ms. Jen Slamp. Um, outside of the classroom, we have many instructional support specialists who have lent support to this pilot implementation, and they include Ms. Ana Silva, Ms. Allison Quijano, Ms. Susan Thompson, and Ms. Andrea Wagner. Um, and so before you, um, we have a recommendation to adopt this curriculum for our newcomer emergent multilingual learners and ask uh, if you have any questions or comments. Thank you, Ms. Larios Horton, for naming, because that's so important uh, to applaud the work and acknowledge how much effort has gone in. Any other questions? Any questions or comments from the board? All right, I think we are ready for an action then. Uh, Ms. Ford. Oh, Rose had her hand up. Go for it. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, Ms. Munoz. Okay, yeah, I'd like to make the motion to approve. Excellent. Uh -huh. I'll second. Okay, Ms. Ford, thanks so much. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now uh, um, F4, adoption of the Santa Barbara Unified School District Work Experience Education District Plan. Thank you, President Caps. Um, yes, I'm honored to introduce Ms. Carson, our district's career technical education coordinator for this um, welcomed and overdue report about our work experience education program. Um, take it away, Ms. Carson. Thank you so much. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Maldonado and members of the community. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you about our work experience education plan. 
Santa Barbara Unified students have both educational and personal development needs that can be met through real world experiences. When students are able to engage in relevant learning classes and participate in work experience, Beyond the classroom environment, they are able to develop career readiness skill, skills in a more meaningful way than if they were only in the classroom or only in a work environment. We have offered work experience education, which sometimes is referred to as we or work ed, as a course in our district at each of our high schools for over a decade. And we currently have 100 students enrolled in work experience education this school year. We also have approximately 250 students who are not enrolled in work experience education, but who are working in our community on a district issued work permit. As we continue to evaluate how we are best preparing our students for college and career readiness, developing courses like work experience education and having a plan to look at our data around work permits is crucial to our practice. Our work experience education plan has not been reviewed or updated since 2012. So the work experience education plan that is being presented is a renewed effort to codify the best practices for our district around work experience education as described by federal and state labor laws, the CDE and CAWI, the California Association of Work Experience Educators. There was an intent to bring this plan to you in the spring of last year, and that was put on hold due to all of the changes and upheavals from the pandemic. Um, and while we are ex still experiencing the repercussions of COVID-19, we felt that it was important that we bring this plan forward because even in the midst of the pandemic, our students continue to work and our families and our community want our students to work. So it behooves us to bring forward a plan that will support everyone in these efforts. The WE plan that has been shared describes the different types of work experience education, the responsibilities of the district in offering work experience education, the responsibilities of the teachers, and the responsibilities and expectations for work experience students. The plan also outlines the process and documents needed for school sites in our district to issue work permits and presents federal and state assurances that the district will follow. You'll see on this slide that there are three different types of work experience education that are recognized in the state and that are outlined in the plan. All of the WE classes offer students the opportunity to earn credit for their work, but each type of class is slightly different. The first is the exploratory work experience education class. It's a class that we don't currently offer, but intend to develop in the future. It allows students to have short-term unpaid job placement opportunities in a variety of work environments to give them exposure to a number of different industry sectors and careers. General work experience education is a course where students who are being paid to work on a work permit are also able to earn credits towards their transcript through work. In addition to their job, students participate in a curriculum that covers topics such as how to have difficult conversations in the workplace, what a safe workplace environment is, and how to build a resume. And more importantly, they meet with their teacher at least once a week one-on-one -on -one, so their teacher can also monitor their grades and their attendance. And if they need to step in and support the student in, the in a challenging workplace environment, or if the student is having difficulty with a work-life school balance, this, the teacher knows and is able to offer that support versus a student who is on a work permit and might not have as many of those check-ins without the benefit of work experience education. The teacher also goes to the job site at least once a semester to talk to the student's supervisor. And um, we're very excited about this. The course has been approved to earn students UC A through G credit as an elective course, which speaks to the importance that our CSU and UC schools are placing on work experience as part of college and career readiness. And then the last course is CTE work experience education, which is, um, offers the same opportunities as a general work experience education class, but is specific to the experiences and employment in that particular CTE pathway. Um, I also added a few details about work permits and that the work experience education plan outlines. Um, next slide, please, Brian. And just what can we expect with this plan, especially since it's been so long since it's been approved? Um, Th this plan outlines the link between academic core curriculum with career exploration, career readiness training, and CTE. The goal of work experience education is to make students um, prepared for the workforce. 
It's also going to help provide consistency for the way that all of our secondary schools um, issue work permits and the way that we are following um, all of the different laws and guidelines around work permits and work experience education. Um, it also provides a plan to provide uh, annual professional development for work experience teachers um, so that they can be certified through CAWI, that uh, California association that I mentioned earlier. Um, and CAWI also provides a guaranteed curriculum for teachers who have been certified in work experience education, um, which will help make sure that students are having the same experience um, in work experience education, no matter which school that they attend in our district. It's also important that students, counselors, and families know about work experience education as an option for their students. Um, the fact that students can earn UC A through G credits while taking this course while also being employed is crucial and um, it seems like an opportunity to increase our enrollment in this class. And work experience education cannot happen without a strong partnership with our community. So putting, um, putting this plan together helps provide us uh, guidelines and expectations that we can share with our community and that there would be an annual data review of this plan every three years so that we don't have another um, another time where we haven't we haven't been able to see this plan so that was me talking very quickly at the end of a long night uh, this concludes my comments about the proposed work experience plan thanks again for providing me with the opportunity and for your ongoing support of college and career readiness Thank you, Ms. Carson. It's nice to have you join our board meeting. And I, this is, I am uh, such an advocate of this type of real life experience. I'm glad to understand more about this program. So thanks for explaining it so well. Uh, any other board members have questions? I see Ms. Ford's hand up. Uh, I just have to say ditto. Tiffany, uh, this was a comprehensive plan. So well presented, easy to read and terribly thoughtful. So just wanted to say thank you. Okay, and Mr. Roust, if you don't mind unsharing your screen just so I can navigate, thank you so much. Um, otherwise I can't see people. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Sims Moten. Yes, um, thank you very much for this presentation. And I know I'm dating myself when I ask this question, but is this kind of like the old um, ROP class, regional occupational type of thing tie in? Where are you, Tiffany? I'm, I'm here. Okay. Um, it's uh, so CTE career technical education courses um, are often linked to uh, ROP courses. There are many components that are similar, but uh, with some 21st century twists and upgrades, work experience classes have been around for a long time. Um, but people just have not been aware of them. And so uh, it's a really exciting opportunity to make that link between the classroom and the workplace environment. Yeah, I think that's a really good thing. I mean, you know, with people who, who maybe college isn't a, maybe initially isn't a fit for them, but there's an also an opportunity for them to get real world experience before they even go to college. So I, I really appreciate that. And hopefully we're able to elevate or increase the enrollment in that. So people can, if they need to take a gap year, they're still able to, you know, get some experience in the world at the same time. Yeah, Ms. Dr. Reed, thanks Ms. Dutton. I just, I would support Ms. Sims Moten's comments and also um, uh, Ms. Carson, I just wanted to acknowledge you because you've done such great work with CTE and I don't know if we really have acknowledged you in that way. And it was great to have your little square up here that we can say mm -hmm. thank you for the work that you've done because it is vital that we have these options yeah. for our students. And it's vital, vital, vital that we have these opportunities and, um, and I just feel it's time that um, we acknowledge you for your leadership and where you have taken this program. And so thank you very much for this plan as well. Thank you. Ms. Munoz. Yes, I'd also like to acknowledge your, um, your work on this. And I think that, you know, a couple things. One is that the work experience is so valuable you know, for our students to choose a career um, that they can get um, 
you know, support on with the teachers and so forth, and also the um, preparation for the teachers so that regardless of what school they go to, as you said, you know, that the students receive um, a standard, you know, um, curriculum and support. Um, and thank you so much too for emphasizing that you know they would um, earn the UC A to G credit, um, which is you know invaluable. So thank you so much. Okay, um, I believe we're ready for a motion to to approve this. I will move, um, and I need a second, Dr. Reed. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We echo the thanks, Ms. Carson, and uh, happy to talk, think about this. And I do have a feeling of wanting to hear more when we get back to more normal reality of, of students who are actually, you know, participating. And, and so I encourage you to don't be a stranger and come back and tell us how things are going uh, with this valuable program in the future. And we are all looking forward to that. Wonderful, thank you. You bet, thank you. Okay, so uh, that leads us to our last action agenda item, which is F5, approval of variable term waiver, and that's Dr. Becchio. All right, thank you and good evening again. Uh, this next item will make um, Tiffany Carson happy upon its approval, because this is a CTE teacher who um, we did have to hire um, I think it was right towards the beginning of the school year, we had an um, expansion of the DP um, um, industrial, uh, not industrial tech, I'm blanking, but um, the uh, tech program out there, Woodshop, and um, I taught the course, so I should know what it's called, but I'm blanking. Anyways, um, so Michael Eckberg uh, joined our teaching force and does have a CTE credential, but um, they do not receive the CLAD through that credential. And so um, I can assure you he is enrolled and uh, will be clearing that credential. Upon a clearing, he, he actually gets the CLAD. So what we're doing is applying through the CTC to, um, to actually get him a variable, ter variable term waiver. In order to do that, we just need board approval to go ahead and, and make that application to CTC. Sounds good to me. Any questions or comments? I move approval of the request. Mountain. Sorry, did I hear? I missed a second. Okay, I see a second. Miss Ford. All in favor? Aye. 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 Oops. Thank you, Dr. Recchio. Um, okay, now we're back to the report discussion agenda. We've already obviously taken care of G1, so we are going to move to G2. Again, Dr. Becchio, you've got the next three. You can stay on yes. deck here. Uh, we'll G let, me, um, let me give the board a backdrop here to the next three items. Um, what um, our contract with both labor, uh, labor unions is good through 2021. And so what we will be doing is entering into successor contract negotiations. And that's different from what a normal year would be would just be reopeners to our current contract and things we want to settle with the bargaining units within that contract. The successor uh, bargaining uh, that's going to happen is, is to actually redo our three-year contract with both, both labor unions. And so you'll see that language um, coming back to you, coming to you tonight and then coming back to you on our next board meeting because there is statutory requirements that we sunshine our proposals uh, to the public so they have an opportunity to see them, to make comment about what we're going to bargain, and then the board takes action to approve those proposals. So you'll see these come back to you three times. Tonight will be the first reading and sunshining of these proposals. Um, then I'll bring them back to the next board meeting um, as a public hearing. And then just after that public hearing, we'll have them on the action um, agenda to get a board approval for these proposals. Uh, CSEA's proposal will come to you, should be the next board meeting, and they'll just be one board meeting behind on, on that proposal, which is not a problem. So the first item, G2, um, I just wanted to uh, do the first reading of um, the 
Santa Barbara Teachers Association's proposal for our successor negotiations. And they submitted uh, their proposal to bargain, um, although we will be looking at the entire contract and, and making updates. Uh, they specifically call out wages and compensation, health and welfare, hours and conditions, and special needs students. Any um, questions or comments that you might want to make before we move on to G3? Thanks for the context. Any questions or comments? Nope. All right, so item G3 outlines um, the Santa Barbara Unified's um, proposal to negotiate the successor contract uh, with California School Employees Association or CSEA. And you'll notice that we have proposed to bargain um, evaluations and vacation leaves. Any questions? Uh, I don't see any. Thank you so much. Okay. And then the final item, G4, is our Santa Barbara Unified School District's um, proposal to bargain and successor contract negotiations with SBTA. And we have indicated a proposal to bargain wages, health and welfare benefits, hours and conditions, and the evaluation procedures. And again, those um, items will come back again for a public yep. hearing and then an action item. Excellent. All right. Okay. I think we're good. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Uh, we are now moving into coming events. Any items or comments or, or contributions for item I, which is coming events? I would just. Ms. Simpson. Yes. I would just like to remind us of the deadline for the Martin Luther King essay and poetry contest. And I forwarded that to Cammie and Ms. L'Oreal just to. You can just easily get in there because we're not going to meet before it actually does, I think. So, but just to remind that, get those, because I, I just can't wait to hear what they have to say. I think it's going to be awesome. So, thanks. That's great. Thanks for that reminder. Okay. Oh. And yes, I said vote. Yep. Vote. <laughs> <laughs> that is a big coming event for all of us to vote uh, and for our students to vote. 17 and on up. Um, okay. Uh, future agenda items, anything that the board wants to raise? Dr. Reed. Yes, as I uh, brought forward earlier in my board comments, I, I want to bring forward um, that we have a specific laid out plan for a student board member to be put on the board. And I'd like to have um, a plan that's transparent that can be implemented and um, in 2021, and I'd like to have that plan by December. Ms. Maldonado, Superintendent, is that possible? Yes, uh, we have had some conversations. Ms. Carey and Ms. Laura Worcester Dorfman and I will be working with our student advisory group to uh, bring forward a plan, and we can bring that to you at our December meeting. Thank you. Excellent. Good. Um, okay, so that leads us to the last. Um, Item here is item K, which is our next meeting. It's Tuesday, November 10th, 2020. And with that, I move, oh, Superintendent Maldonado, I see your hand up. Last clarification, uh, do we need to bring back at our next agenda the addition of the January 5th meeting? Is that how we need to? Um, yeah, you know, it's always good to raise special meetings. We can call them at any time. We don't need to okay. agendize them. But uh, certainly, it's good to put put that on there. We don't have to take a vote, but we should certainly list it so that the public is aware. Um, so yes, thank you for flagging that. But it doesn't, in my uh, understanding, it doesn't require a vote of our board to okay. schedule a second uh, a special meeting. So we will just then advertise it on our website that there is a meeting schedule. Yes. So we're all, I think, yes, you've achieved a consensus around the fact that we'll be doing that meeting. And thanks for bringing that up. And we can uh, highlight it on the agenda and also put it on the website as of now. Thank you. Okay, 1024, it is time to adjourn. I wanna appreciate everybody here. 
uh, for a productive meeting, tough stuff. And I really enjoyed the information and um, thanks to the public and thanks to all of you. And with that, I am without a gavel adjourning our meeting for tonight on October 27th. Happy Halloween.